this afternoon, I'll call to, meeting, call to order the May 2021 meeting of the Johnson County Community College Board of Trustees. I'm Greg Musil, the chair of the board. Please help me uh, begin our meeting by honoring our country with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We have all trustees present. Uh, Trustee Lawson is present via Zoom and virtually. Uh, the other six trustees are present in the room today. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is not technically on the agenda, but I thought it was worth noting. On April 21st, 2021, the first president of Johnson County Community College passed away at age 97. Um, Dr. Robert Harris was the first president. Uh, Dr. Bown is our sixth president in the 51 year history of the college. Um, Dr. Harris was back here in 2000, uh, from the 50th anniversary, 2019. Mm -hmm. um, and you can see on the slide here that there are various photographs of him on the left as president, later in life on the right, and the top middle is uh, with Trustee Chair Cook at the time um, in, I think, the president's office, it looks like. Mm -hmm. yep. At the bottom, I've been told uh, the four people there are from left to right. John Pierce, then Dr. Harris, Richard Randolph, and Sonny Maynard. Mm -hmm. John Pierce was one of the early administrators when the campus started in, in downtown Merriam as director of community co cooperation and later um, adult continuing education. And by 77, 78, he was director of development. Uh, Richard Dick Randolph was among the first faculty members hired um, as an instructor. He was in the business program. And on the right is Sonny Maynard, who was the first baseball coach at Johnson County Community College, as well as coaching women's basketball at JCCC. Um, I think the other ones are all living, as far as I know. Uh, but we're sad to learn of the passing of Dr. Harris, and I thought it was worth noting. Uh, this institution is 51 years old, and it's, uh, it's good to, to know our history and build on it. And so uh, please keep... Uh, Dr. Harris and his family in your thoughts and prayers. Um, we'll move on to the award and recognition section of the agenda. Dr. Bown? I believe uh, Dr. McLeod will have this. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, we have this year uh, some awards uh, won by our faculty and staff through the League for Innovation. And because of the um, issues we've dealt with over the last year with COVID, we will be uh, delivering the 2019-2020 award for innovation of the year and the 2020 and 2021 um, excellence award. <clears throat> so when you look at our 2019 and 2020 innovator innovation of the year award, uh, we had a, a number of, of growth opportunities for students who needed extra help with classes. And so that year we had uh, some of our professors and counselors and coordinators really start to work on ways in which we could provide more supports for students um, through our academic resource center. And so the winners of the 2019-2020 Innovation of the Year Award is Megan Doyle, assistant professor, Sarah Evans, who is one of our uh, academic specialist, Denise Philly, uh, counselor, Valerie Mann, who is an associate professor in our academic uh, and college learning space and is chair uh, who, who works in college success, uh, and Crystal Stokes, a coordinator in college success. That team uh, built a program to, to work with our students more effectively in the ARC, as well as looking at scholarship opportunities to help students do co-requisite learning uh, as they come out of developmental coursework. So I'd like to, to give uh, so, some applause to that group. Um, and then our 2020-2021 Excellence Award recipients uh, is Dean Lenora Cook uh, and two of our directors, Deanne Belshi and Julie Niemeyer, who looked at ways uh, to build out 
uh, opportunities for students in our health occupations fields. So uh, if you could, uh, if you run across these folks or you have opportunity to get emails from them or, or talk with them, please uh, give them all your congratulations for representing this institution with such strength and such grace and, and providing us with an opportunity to garner some, some very worthy and very important awards um, over the last two years. Thank you, Dr. McLeod. I think we can. It's unfortunate that we can't have them here, uh, get them on camera and give them a few moments to, to talk about what they do for the college uh, because the last year was especially uh, challenging for everybody. And we thank you for bringing those forward and congratulations to those faculty and staff members who uh, helped, helped attain those in a way that helped student success. So thank you very much. Greg, in addition, uh, Mr. Chair, we have uh, Dr. Weber is going to uh, recognize uh, athletics. Okay. Dr. Weber? Yeah, thanks. Um, I want to talk a little bit, but need to set the table a bit. So as I, as I think about our students and how they've managed through the pandemic, one word continually comes to mind, and that's resilience. So while many of our students have exhibited resilience and and in, in ways navigating their educational journey during the pandemic. <clears throat> I wanted to take some time this evening and recognize the accomplishments of a specific population. And that is our student athletes and particularly our postseason success of our indoor sports. Uh, but before I do, I wanted to provide a little bit of context. In the fall semester, we weren't even sure there'd be an athletic season for any sport. We had a small COVID wake up during the fall and had to shut things down for a few days to remind everyone of the importance of following protocol. Then we needed to continually stress the importance of taking care of academics along with finding modified ways to practice and prepare for the potential of the season. Teams were executing drills socially distanced, wearing masks and finding all new ways to communicate and compete as teams. At the end of the fall semester, amidst all of the athletic uncertainties, over 70% of our student athletes earned a 3.0 GPA or higher. And that's an amazing accomplishment given the circumstances, but it wouldn't have been possible without the support and decisions of the college to, to do things like keeping uh, on-campus tutoring available and access to study halls and computer labs. So thanks for your support in those decisions. And this brings us to the spring semester when all teams got an opportunity to compete. From a state safety standpoint, we're proud to say zero JCCC competitions were canceled due to COVID outbreaks within our team. We did have a few uh, competitions canceled as a result of opponent cases, um, but our athletic department led by our training staff took our protocol very seriously. So that commitment led to each of our three indoor sports making it to their respective national tournaments. The men's basketball team led by first year coach Brand Chapel completed a 16 and six season, won their region tournament and earned their berth to their national tournament his first season. The women's basketball team led by head coach Ben Conrad spent much of the regular season ranked number one in the country and undefeated through the regular season and were upset in their region tournament finals. Uh, they did earn the first ever uh, at large berth to the national tournament and, and, and they leveraged it and, and went all the way to the national championship game and lost a hog fought battle. Uh, we're up four or five points with about three, four minutes to go. And just uh, unfortunately it was a game of runs and we didn't have the last run. So their season ended at 22 and two. It was uh, Coach Conrad's third appearance in the national championship game over the six last six tournaments. And as many of you recall, we won it in our gym six years ago. Uh, the JCCC volleyball team won their district tournament and earned a number four seed in the national <clears> tournament. <throat> in the quarterfinals, they accomplished an amazing feat by fending off the home team's four consecutive match points and eventually winning. Then they followed up by beating the number one team in the semis and the number two seed in the finals, which you were all able to watch the conclusion of at last month's board meeting. Their national championship is the second in JCCC program history and is the first for coach Jennifer I during her 13 years at JCCC. She's taken nine teams to the tournament overall. Unfortunately, due to finals and other schedule conflicts, the team's not here to say a few words, but we do have a bit, few video clips they recorded at their athletic awards banquet. Um, and we have coaches here as well. So here are the clips from the team.
just wanted to say thank you so much for the opportunity to play this year. Our win wouldn't have been possible without you guys. COVID was really hard on us, but you guys allowed us to have a season. And we want to say thank you for supporting us and being there for us whenever we needed anything. And we couldn't have done anything without you guys. We would like to present to you the first place national championship trophy. Johnson on three, one, two, three, Johnson! Thank you! So this was really special for them because these teams, um, they really went the entire fall not having a clue if they would have a season. And, and, and psychologically, it was tough on them. This is why, you know, a lot of them are in school for their education, but, but their sense of identity while they're in school is their athletic pursuits. And so it was great to see them um, gain that confidence and be able to perform and perform well in a safe way. So thank you guys for your continued support and, and giving them the opportunity to be successful. Thank you, Randy. Uh, those reports are always welcome. Keep them coming. <laughs> National championship every year in some sport would be fabulous. Uh, and the 70% with a 3.0 or higher GPA is, is always impressive. And I think our coaches, our trainers, our athletics director uh, underneath you do a great job. So thank you for your leadership in, so, in those programs. Mr. Chair, then if we could build on this. Normally we do a student story late in the meeting, mm -hmm. um, but keeping with our theme of our student, our student athletes, um, we wanted you to meet tonight one of our student athletes from the volleyball team. And so if we could bring Kelly up. Um, she is um, a sophomore. Uh, she's a setter on the team and uh, a, an absolutely fine young person um, who's done incredibly well academically and incredibly well as part of a national championship team. So Kelly, thanks so much for being with us today. Uh, tell us about yourself um, and uh, your time here at, at Johnson County Community College. Yes, well, thank you for having me, first of all. Um, my name is Kelly Finsky. Like you said, I am a sophomore setter on the Johnson volleyball team. Um, I am from Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. That's where I've grown up, that's where I was born. Um, I chose Johnson because as soon as I visited here er, at Johnson, I fell in love with the campus. It was the nicest school I had visited. I loved the environment. Everyone was so friendly and Coach I is just a great coach. Um, I am studying exercise physiology as of right now. I want to possibly do physical therapy. So we'll see how that goes. Um, the pandemic affected everyone, as we all know, but um, as a student, it was really tough to uh, just adapt to the online schooling, not having any in-person classes and just learning how to kind of teach yourself if you didn't have a Zoom meeting or anyone like physically there to teach you. Um, and as the athlete, the pandemic had tremendous effect on everything. Uh, like he said before, we weren't even sure if we were going to play at all this year. And luckily, because of you guys and everyone, uh, we were able to. So we thank you for that. Um, but practicing with masks, playing with masks, that really is a lot harder than it may seem. It is because it's hard to breathe regardless, but you put something over your nose and your mouth. It makes it way more difficult. Um, and just the uncertainty of the season and if we were going to get to play the next match or the next game or if there was even, even going to be a national tournament. Um, that was all really hard on us, but it really taught us how to push through and our team came together and the team chemistry was just absolutely incredible this year. Um, if we wouldn't have pushed through, like we we're all on the same page, I don't think we would have made it to the national tournament, but COVID really pushed us to work even harder than we like, than we would have without it. So um, my plans for next year, I actually just committed to Drury University. I will continue playing volleyball and my academics there. So. Can you say, say that again? Where are you going? A bit about me. Drury. Uh, Drury University. Gotcha. In Springfield, Missouri. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fantastic. A little closer to home, Kelly. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we typically let some board members see if they won't have any questions for you. So I'm going to open the floor to that and look to Laura, who always has a question. <laughs> <laughs> 
Hi, Kelly. Thank you so much for coming to our board meeting and sharing a little bit about you. Um, I don't know if you, there, there we go. Um, my question would be, what are you most proud about? This has been a year that um, I think any of us in education have, would say was really difficult, and I'd love to know what you are the most proud about as a student. As a student, I am proud personally that I was able to make the adjustment and keep myself accountable um, for doing my work, even though there wasn't someone there physically to tell me to do my work. Because um, I know for a lot of people, it's hard to stay motivated. And uh, I'm just really proud that I finished this year strong and that I was just able to push through just as everyone else. An accomplishment for sure. Thank you so much and congratulations. Thank Th you. Thanks for being here, Kelly. I'm Jerry Cook. And um, we've heard the excitement and the passion of being down four set points by Dr. Weber and by Randy Stang, our athletic director, but take 60 seconds or so and explain uh, what it means to a setter to be down four set points and come back and win. What was going through the team at the time? So um, as a setter, you're kind of like the quarterback of the team. You run all the plays, you, you touch the ball every time. Um, and when we were down those four points, I had to go in and serve, and that was a lot to handle mentally but what I expected from my team was that I'm going to give you the ball and I need you to put it down and we did just that we played a perfect game for the last six points of the game so that was really awesome congratulations great great accomplishment now Thank Kelly you. those were four match points not just set points right they were yes if we would have messed up one time we would have lost the game and you were serving I was. When it was 10 to 14, I was serving, and I served until it was 14 14. We think we have so. a lot of pressure up here. That sounds like more. <laughs> That's pretty awesome. Other yeah. questions? Dr. Bannon, you want to close out with okay. Kelly? Thank you, Kelly, for being here. Kelly, we thank you so much. Uh, we're so proud that, that you have uh, chosen Johnson County Community College for your education. Uh, congratulations as you wrap up uh, your semester and uh, prepare for your transfer experience. Um, we're, we're proud of you, and uh, we wish you the best, uh, not only to wrap up the year, but as you move on. So thank you so much. Appreciate your time tonight. Come back and see the banner because there will be something in the gym. I oh, it's up. It's up already. It's All up. Right. Yeah. Good. Yeah, we got Good to see it. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you guys so much. All right. I won't throw you any more curveballs. <laughs> Mr. Chair. Yes, Dr. Dr. One, one last thing on that. I, I, for those of us that were there, uh, it was also a great accomplishment for Coach I to be named National Coach of the That's Year. Right. Yeah. And uh, she, she just deserves so much credit for uh, her great work. Nine times, I think, in 13 years to the national tournament is pretty, pretty incredible. Yeah. Okay, I think we're ready to move on to the open forum. <laughs> the open forum is a period of each regularly scheduled board meeting where members of the public have the right to address the, address the board on issues related to the college. Um, typically, each a speaker would have five minutes unless there are more than there are a number of them, in which case the chair has the authority to limit it to three minutes. Um, we ask that speakers, when they do that, be respectful. Uh, when they're in person, stay at the podium and not address items of individual students or individual personnel issues. Um, typically, we don't respond at the board meeting on those things, and especially if it's something that's an individual private student matter, a private personnel matter, or um, something that the college is addressing in another forum. Um, for our during our COVID and our Zoom meetings, uh, the requirement is that you register at 5 p.m. by 5 p.m. the night before on the Wednesday before our meeting, and there were no registered speakers for tonight's meeting. But if you want to register for the June 17th meeting, um, you need to register on June 16th um, by 5 o'clock p.m. Because mm -hmm. I believe we will still be virtual at that time. Uh, the next item is board reports, and the first one is from our college lobbyist, uh, Dick Carter, reporting on the end of the legislative session, or the almost end. 
We, we are at the end, Mr. Chairman. I'm coming to you live from the halls of Troy at Topeka High School, uh, where in a little bit I'll be giving uh, another report at the uh, PTO meeting, our final one of the year. So that's what you see in the background this evening. Uh, the session that has been like no other has finally come to a close. Uh, the legislature concluded its regular business uh, of the 2021 session around 2.15 a.m. on Saturday, May 8th. Uh, veto overrides were a plenty when lawmakers returned to Topeka on May 3rd. Uh, legislators overrode five bills. Um, Senate Bill 50, uh, I'll talk about briefly, is a uh, t large tax policy bill that has been in the works for three years. It's been vetoed twice before, and uh, it'll be interesting to see how uh, things work since there is a cost of around $300 million over the next two years. Uh, but since revenues continue to exceed expectations, which is what fueled legislators to pass this measure, to override the, the governor's veto, that is, um, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll just have to see what happens. Again, in April of this month, the end of, of April, revenues were up $93 million. That's after the consensus revenue estimating group met and revised up the figures uh, once, once again. Kansas legislature followed suit on four additional bills uh, one we watched pretty closely was the measure to lower the concealed carry age uh, to 18 years old. State law currently allows 18-year-olds to carry a gun. This law, however, would allow 18 to 20-year-olds to file for a concealed carry uh, weapons permit. Uh, the legislature did not attempt to override two separate measures dictating education curriculum to the Kansas uh, schools, uh, K-12 schools, Schools, that is, regarding financial literacy and civics, as well as an NRA-based firearm curriculum. So those two weren't even attempted. Uh, the, the legislature did fail to override Senate Bill 55, which prescribed limitations on women's sports. With the passage of the College Promise Act earlier in April, that left the funding in question. As you'll recall, uh, the bill itself uh, was subject to a $10 million uh, funding limit. Um, during committee discussion in both the House and Senate Budget Committees, the funding was included at the $10 million level. Uh, all good news. Then when the discussion began on a maintenance of effort matter that was tied to federal funding, uh, things started to get a little dicey. Our funding was, was secure, uh, but then uh, there became an issue of uh, tying federal funds, other federal funds, both to K-12 and to higher ed, uh, to a maintenance of effort uh, issue that was required by uh, federal law. The legislature approved $53 million toward that maintenance of effort uh, issue. It is, should be $106 million, both for this year and for the next year. That will be, um, we'll see what happens. The, uh, the state intends to apply for a waiver. Uh, I don't know if that waiver will be passed or not. Uh, if the waiver request is not uh, honored at the federal level, um, that, that puts Kansas in a bind for additional federal funds. So we'll see what, we'll see what happens when, uh, when that uh, waiver application goes to the federal government. There were no significant changes to Senate Bill 40, which set guidelines for COVID pandemic management. Um, having said that, legislators did make some reparations in a couple of bills that would grant, looking forward this is, grant property tax relief for each day a business was shut down by a government order. Uh, that measure is contained in House Bill 2313, which also includes the statutory 20 mills for school funding in Kansas. Senate Bill 273 is a culmination of COVID reparation efforts that began as Senate Bill 286. The fact that I'm mentioning numbers really isn't important because things change so fast in the, uh, at the end of the legislative session. Uh, but just to give you a sense, um, that's, the, that's the conference committee report that things ended up in. Under the conference committee agreement that was adopted, businesses can apply for relief during a certain period that coincides with the pandemic. I would say that the good news for institutions like us, other local units of government, is that the payment funds will come from federal assistance dollars rather than state or local funds. That was the original uh, way the bill was written. So, so that's why I'm kind of providing an update on, on what those reparations look like they won't come out of uh, the budgets of locally governed bodies uh, across the state of Kansas. Uh, the College Promise Act, as mentioned earlier, uh, was passed separately by the House and Senate in um, late March, early April. 
the conference committee married the two bills into a product that was a bit different than its origination. But the end product is essentially the same, last dollar assistance to those who are part of the program. I've provided a detailed breakdown uh, and an explanation of the program that is at the end of this report. However, at this time, uh, I'm, I want to uh, recognize Kate Allen to give you some additional updates as they pertain to Johnson County Community College. Thanks, Dick. My name is Kate Allen, and I serve as Vice President for Advancement and Government Affairs. And as Dick said, I'm providing a, a brief summary of the Kansas College Promise Bill. I know the trustees received a more comprehensive summary, and Dr. Baum felt it might be important for this legislation that we verbalize uh, a summary for our larger audience here at uh, JCCC. This was approved by Governor Kelly last month. Uh, the College Promise concept, uh, you, some may be familiar with it. It's alive and well in hundreds of other cities, institutions, uh, even several states. Uh, each have uh, its own rules and parameters, and the intent behind, the legislative intent behind our Kansas College Promise Bill is to support workforce development within our borders. It is the first of its kind to come out of Topeka, so we are excited about that. The basic premise of the Kansas College Promise Bill is to provide no-cost tuition, books, and materials to certain students who are uh, pursuing certain eligible careers. And it's important to note that this is a program that impacts credit students. It is not currently for our continuing ed students. The credit students must have graduated from a Kansas high school in the last 12 months, or they, it could be a Kansan who is at least 21 years old and has lived in our state for the last three years. So that's who is eligible. Then they have to enroll in an eligible program. Currently, there are four academic categories that are eligible. Uh, and then each institution gets to select their own fifth category. So the four legislated categories are first, informational, information technology and security. Second is physical and mental health care. Third is early childhood education and development. And then fourth is the advanced manufacturing and building trades. So this means that every program within those categories would be eligible. So when I when I mentioned physical and mental health care, that would be our nursing program, our respiratory care program, everything that would be within that category. All those programs would be promise eligible. And then the fifth choice that uh, JCCC submitted for is our um, ASL interpreting program. So that would be our, our personal selection. All schools would have their own fifth category. And But again, it's important to note that all of these courses are, are kind of pending approval still from the Kansas Board of Regents. So we're not fully official yet, but that's where we're headed. Uh, the students then, after they pick their, their, uh, their course, if it's eligible, they have to fill out the FAFSA. So much like the College Promise program that we discussed on our campus a few years ago, this would be a last dollar program. So that means that every student has to use their federal aid first, their Pell or whatever federal aid they might get, as well as any other institutional aid or foundation scholarship or any kind of outside funding they can get, has to be first before the promised dollars are applied. We don't want them to use personal money, but any scholarships would come first, then promise money. The student would sign the contract that's being developed, um, and as a promise recipient, they would be agreeing to a two-year Kansas work live requirement at the end of the program. If they go and get their bachelor's, that would be on hold until they finish their bachelor's, then the two years would take effect. So as it stands today, a JCCC student who graduated from from here, but gets a job on the plaza, they would not be in compliance. They would have to pay back their promised scholarship. And again, that's because this is a Kansas workforce development program funded by Kansas taxpayers. Uh, what's not covered, remedial courses, unless they are delivered in a co-requisite format. Most of us grew up with the prerequisite format, and that is the JCCC model by and large. But the co-requisite model, as the name suggests, allows students to take the remedial course and the credit course concurrently. Um, so that's an issue we'll just need to be aware of and think through. Another piece to navigate is who manages the collections process for students who don't complete the requirements. We believe that it's looking like it will be the Kansas Board of Regents who will manage that, not the individual institutions. But that's also being finalized right now. Um, and then as far as the budget, $10 million was set aside for this project across the entire state. So it's really important that all the colleges work together 
so that we report to we report maybe weekly, maybe every other week into some uh, common clearinghouse with, with the Board of Regents to make sure we do not overspend that amount. So how that's going to work is also being um, determined. So these are just a few of the more complex pieces that, that we're, we're trying to get navigated. Um, considerable moving parts, obviously, but this is really transformational for our college. And I'm really excited that there was so many Johnson County delegates who supported this and really were the leaders for this. So that they should be thanked. And I also think it's important to acknowledge um, our student services and enrollment team, our institutional research, our marketing team, our counselors, they are the ones that are going to try to get this, or are trying to get this stood up as quickly as possible with our um, with our with our board of regents. Again, we already have students who've applied for fall, so some of this is going backwards and looking to see who might who might fit this program. But um, it's a great new development for our for our campus for our community. But um, there's a lot still being worked out. So that's my that's my five minute overview. And Dick, unless you have any other questions um, or any other comments, I guess we're open for questions. Anything else, Dick, before questions? I don't think so. Uh, the legislature returns on May 26th for uh, sine die. Um, the Senate will be um, selecting a new majority leader, and so that will provide a little bit of uh, reading material between now and uh, next week or, or uh, May 26th. So, Kate, I'll start with one question. The $10 million, is there any or both of you, any formula or plan at this point as to how that will be split up? Will that be allocated? First come. It first come, first serve? It is first come, first serve. What does that mean? What, what is, so if, if the other 18 community colleges used it up, we would get zero, so we have to get going? That's exactly right. So we're trying to work together with all of our, our sister colleges to promote this as a statewide program. But it is, um, it is definitely something that we hope bears fruit for us and our, our local students. But it, is a, it will be a promotional issue. You know, high schools are just about to experience graduation, and yet we aren't totally approved yet to be able to promote. So we are, all schools are, cha are challenged with that. But it, is, it, is a, it will be a race to access those dollars, yes. I think we'll all be very interested in how those dollars are allocated in this first year and whether it's a, there's a fair split for Johnson County taxpayers who uh, contribute significantly to the state general fund. Other questions? Uh, Trustee Snyder. Uh, Kate, a question for you. What was it that you said would be the college's fifth kind of discretionary focus for the Promise Act? Sure, it's the American Sign Language and Interpreting Program, and I don't know if Dr. McLeod would like to expand on what those courses are in that program, but that's our fifth choice that we selected. Got it. Yeah, Thank and, you. It, and actually, um, Trustee, to, it expands to our interpreting program writ large, which includes uh, American Sign Language Interpreting, as well as legal and medical interpreting through our foreign language program, which um, focuses on on our uh, help and translation for non-English speakers uh, in need of, of medical and legal assistance in, in the county. Thank you. Could you tell us why why we picked that? Is it the availability of jobs, the demand for those? It is. It is both the availability of jobs, the driving need um, that we serve in in helping. Um, both the immigrant community and uh, the, the deaf and non-speaking community, um, as well as um, the, our desire to, to really aid in, in helping our public specifically in categories that are underserved. Uh, I'm going to remind speakers on staff, Kate, you did a good job uh, to identify yourself and your position. We heard just now from Dr. Mickey McLeod, Executive Vice President for Instruction and Chief Academic Officer, and early from doc, Dr. Randy Weber, Executive Vice President for Student Success, so that, because some of, I, I can't see it when it pops up here if your name is there, but I, I don't think your title's there. So if we could do that. Other questions for Dick? Uh, Trustee Snyder? So, yes, uh, and this one is for Dick. Um, wh where did the college end out? end up from a budget perspective with state allocations? I, I know the broad strokes what higher education as a whole got, but I, I lost how much, are we doing better than we did last year? We, we are, Trustee Snyder. This is Dick Carter, college lobbyist. 
and we are uh, doing better than than we have in the past. Uh, not only were uh, was our funding restored, um, we also will gain a little with the uh, MOE funding to the tune of uh, five million dollars, not to our college, but uh, split amongst the uh, 19 community colleges for capital or equipment purchases. Now, there's a little hiccup there as well. Um, legislative intent was for those dollars to be divided by on a formula based on FTE at each institution. That means we would do very well. That language was not specifically included, though though it was directed, uh, was not included in the final version of the bill. Hence, this is where we run into problems uh, in at 2 a.m. sessions mm -hmm. when we're suspending rules, uh, not having to print or view um, the, the budget itself. And so that is one of the, the problems that legislators are working on figuring out how that distribution will work. So I don't have a specific number for you, but we are, we are fully funded um, to levels that, that uh, we were requesting uh, at the overall higher ed level. And then we will get some additional dollars through that maintenance of effort funding, both, both, in, both in the current fiscal year and the next fiscal year. Thank you. Yes, sir. Trustee Cross. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to take a moment to uh, comment on, uh, I'm eight years on this board, nearing a ninth, thanks to the wisdom of the legislature to extend our terms. And uh, I don't remember a better report out of Topeka. So I wanted to commend everyone for the work that they've done, the relationships that I know they've maintained for many, many years, and frankly, the leadership of this board and administration. So I just... Unless I'm missing something, I think this is pretty good news. Somebody yes. could set me straight, uh, but I just want to throw in my two cents. Like, good job, everyone. Other questions or comments? I, I don't want to throw cold water, but I think we dodged some real bullets this year as well. We did. With the legislature deciding curriculum for K-12, and that will, that, if done, will turn into curriculum for higher education. Um, so I think there were there the, the budget numbers are better for Kansas finally, and that is that has turned into better funding for K-12 and for higher education. Um, I agree with you, uh, Trustee Cross. That our, our team has done a good job, and the community colleges as a whole working across the state. Thank you, yes. Trustee Ingram and KACCT, for for trying to keep a unified voice, even though we don't always have the exact same interests uh, in alignment. But um, so I agree. It was. It was a good year. I, I'm, I'm glad it turned out the way it did because there were some things that were worrisome. Trustee Ingram. I, I appreciate you giving me uh, some credit for that. However, I won't accept it. It is truly um, the work of Heather Morgan in collaboration with our college lobbyist, Kate Allen. I, it's, it's a team effort. Dr. Bound coming on board. So um, it's, it's been pretty remarkable, quite frankly. Uh, but a lot of hours, a lot of time, and a lot of confusion that they're trying to get through. So they've done a great job. I'm going to say Dr. Bound is one for one and is on a streak. <laughs> he so is. So we're going to expect is. that again next year. Agreed. That's what I heard. Well, thank you to everyone. <laughs> and, and the other thing that I would also say is, you know, just thank you to our IR. You know, I'm the whole team. Institutional I mean, it just, research? Absolutely. Institutional research. I mean, the, the amount of data that I have seen requested this year has been really remarkable. But it's how quickly the legislature continues to move. And um, it's, it's just day in, day out. And we had to keep up with it. So I appreciate everyone's hard work on that, too across the state. Thank you. As well. Dick and Kate, thank you for your work. Dr. Bound, thank you for your leadership on that effort too because it, it was a good year and it's a team effort always. So thank you both. We'll move now to the Faculty Association President, Dr. Liker. Thank you, Greg. Um, I want to apologize in advance for the hoarseness and excessive coughing you're probably going to have to endure. Um, I'm either a victim of allergies or overuse of voice, so imagine that. I have a short report tonight, some informative, mostly reflective, starting with contract discussions. Last Friday, the Faculty Association and Melody Rails team reached a tentative agreement on a three-year contract. I say tentative because, of course, this requires approval by the board and our bargaining unit. At the FA meeting on Tuesday, the negotiation team publicly presented the details. We've been circulating those in writing. 
I've answered, no kidding, probably 30 emails and half a dozen phone calls since yesterday explaining the proposal's terms. I'm also working with institutional research to facilitate an electronic ratification vote to open next Tuesday. Negotiations is the only process I know in which perfect success is achieved through an equitable distribution of unhappiness. President Callaway used to compare it to sausage making, a thoroughly unwholesome process that produces a savory product. There are aspects of the agreement which some of you will probably question just as there are concerns on our end, which are certain to come back for discussion in 2024. But the important thing is the contract avoids the scenario of 2018 when we entered impasse. It allows the financial stability needed for good planning over the next three years. And in my opinion, it provides a better template for future negotiations to address problems of internal inequity. It's been an exhausting year for everyone and there are more challenges ahead. This deal allows the college to move forward and get on with other business. And for that reason, it has mine and the FA support. Dozens of people got us to this place, but five FA members in particular, Dennis Arjo, Alicia Bradyhoft, Dave Davis, Melanie Harvey, and Tanya Hughes did the heavy lifting and they did it for almost a year. I want that to be remembered. Earlier this week, the college announced full reopening of campus offices will occur by June 7th. I'm not sure this changes much for faculty in that our course delivery methods have been set for some time. And in fact, we're now scheduling for next spring. FA and the deans, I'm sure too, have been fielding questions about room capacity and <clears throat> can I require students to wear masks even if the college doesn't and so forth. Michelle Riley from Hospitality is our ABC rep on the Return to Campus Task Force. She and I will be meeting with Dr. McLeod tomorrow to get what clarity we can on items unique to the academic branch. I know with vaccination rates dropping, the college will soon be making painful decisions about when to resume normal sized gatherings. As you do that, I ask three things on behalf of the bargaining unit. One, that policies about masks and social distancing follow CDC recommendations. We prefer that over state and local guidelines. Two, if it's warranted by a resurgence in COVID rates, the college be prepared to reassess. And three, that you demonstrate the same flexibility you have so far in this crisis by recognizing the needs of individual instructors in individual courses. Depending on content or pedagogy, for instance, the professors need to assign students into small groups. Masks may be necessary in some areas for the foreseeable future. I hope administration will respect that and not try to hold everyone to some tyrannical consistency. Excuse me. So this is May and hence the end of our academic year. It's always a bittersweet time, especially for faculty on nine month contracts. We, we look forward to summer on a less rigid schedule, but we also say goodbye to students and retiring colleagues. For the second May in a row, we've missed the opportunity to do that in person. It will be sad and weird to say the least to return this fall and find so many familiar faces gone. One of the perks of this role is my ability to recognize individuals who've made a real difference. So I'm going to claim that perk and recognize my retiring fellow historian, Vin Clark. Vin was my mentor when I joined JCCC in 2002. He was instrumental in establishing our current system of governance through the academic chair model and was my predecessor as chair of history and political science. Most importantly, Vin served as FA president when Dr. Carlson announced his abrupt retirement after 25 years. It was then working in tandem with your predecessors, people like Lynn Mitchelson and John Stewart, who reassured our community that continued confidence in JCCC's changing leadership was justified. Faculty association can be an adversarial force or it can be a supportive one. Ben had it in him to be both, but I think he leaned toward the latter. Lately, I've been reminded that much of my career has been a toddler's attempt to keep up with him but no matter how fast I went, I was always walking in his tracks. For that, I say thank you not only to him, but to all our faculty retirees. 
Since you met last, the Faculty Association has elected new officers. So please consider extending your gratitude to Eve Blobaum, Diane Davis, and Brian Wright, who are leaving FA leadership, and welcome Amanda Glass, Dave Krug, and Andrea View, who are stepping up. I will serve another year as president with Brett Cooper as vice president. Brett brings a lot of assets to the Faculty Association, not only his leadership skill acquired from directing the Math Resource Center, but his knowledge of KNEA and particularly of the political landscape that affects teacher unions state and nationwide. That knowledge will be valuable as we look ahead to fall elections. Brett will also be delivering the board report in my stead on June 17th. I'll be attending the wedding of a former student, a young man who shifted his career path out of the private sector and into history education as a result of classes he took here. I figure watching him get married is the least I can do after turning him into a historian. <laughs> That's all I got. Jim, thank you for that report. That, I know that will be a special moment to go to a former student's um, wedding. Um, that means you're not only respected, but you're older. <laughs> Thanks, Greg. <laughs> uh, are there any questions for Dr. Liker? Um, we will have an executive session later tonight with respect to the uh, proposed contract, so we'll learn more as Dr. Liker has been uh, letting his association know. So thank you very much, Jim. Uh, next, we'll hear from the Johnson County Education Research Triangle update, Trustee Cross. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the JSERT did meet on April 19th via Zoom. Uh, I just wanted to comment. Uh, I knew I was speaking next, so I didn't take the time there. But uh, Vin Clark, Professor Clark, was somewhat instrumental in uh, my sitting on this board. And uh, the advice and mentorship that he provided me was critical, and I just want to congratulate him for that uh, some eight years ago. Uh, so JSER did meet, uh, Mr. Chair and members of the board, uh, on April 19th. Um, we set another meeting for October 25th, 2021, and briefly, uh, we met, we had reports from K-State Olathe, KU Edwards, and the KU Med Center regarding uh, reports that they're doing with the money that we contribute uh, via the JSER tax, and um, I'm pleased to tell you that uh, revenues are 4.5% for the year over what they were last year. And so uh, I never know whether or not to throw in anecdotal stories, but there really are amazing things uh, that these institutions do. And we, of course, have a seat on the board with uh, many other stakeholders uh, that people can read about on the web. But we'll meet again in October uh, 25th, 2021, and K-State Olathe is adamant that they get their chance to host. So <laughs> that concludes my report, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Trustee Cross. Questions on the Johnson County Education Research Triangle, funded by a one-eight cent sales tax passed in 2008. Um, okay, the next item is Kansas Association of Community College Trustees. Our liaison is Nancy Ingram. Trustee Ingram is also the president of KACCT. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Right now, I do not have a full report at this point. We have our second quarterly meeting coming up on Saturday, June the 5th. So I will have a far greater report for you all next month. So okay. I don't know if Dr. Brown has anything he would like to add, but I think we're good to go. Thank you. If I could chime in. Just yeah, briefly. well, I was going to ask, if, is, will that be will that invitation be shared as it, as it was for the yes. last one? Yes. So we can participate by Zoom. And Trustee Cross? Yes, thank you. Um, over the course of the past six years, I've developed a relationship with Trustee uh, Ingram, and I know that she spends a great deal amount of time in that position and attention to it so that we have just basic intelligence that I think uh, Dick Carter or others could could gather for us, but I think it's critical that we have someone committed to it. And I just wanted to commend her for her role. Thank you. Agreed. Thank it you. take it's taken a lot more time in the last year, I think, than we anticipated. You anticipated. It has been exciting. We didn't care. We wanted you there. That's so, right. That's okay. right. Okay. Uh, thank you. The next report is from the foundation, Trustee Snyder. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the Foundation's Board of Directors met on April 21st at 5.30 via Zoom, and during this meeting, the directors approved the proposed slate of new Foundation members and new Foundation directors. Those new positions will begin on July 1st. 
Uh, during the meeting, the Foundation Board also approved new Executive Committee nominations, uh, and that included uh, electing Marshawn Butler as the new incoming board president. Uh, Marshawn is a vice president at Children's Mercy Hospital and very involved in our community in different capacities. Uh, a listing of the, the slate is available if you would like to contact the foundation office, but uh, no doubt you will know a, a good majority of the people selected. The foundation's investment committee met virtually on April 21st and reviewed the quarterly report provided by Midwest Trust and FCI advisors. And finally, the foundation's, uh, not finally, but uh, the foundation summit chant evening committee uh, met on uh, April, whatever day we had our board meeting, April 17th, 15th, I believe. I didn't have that in here. Uh, that committee is chaired by Chris and Lindsey Gerlock. And at the committee, they approved plans for a hybrid event this year. Uh, more traditional in-person gala will be held on Saturday, November 13th at the Oven Park Convention Center. Uh, the foundation is working closely with the convention center to ensure all available pro protocols and precautions are being uh, considered and there will be a virtual opportunity for those that don't yet feel comfortable attending in person. Uh, and those, those uh, aspects will build upon the successful virtual event last year. More details will be headed your way, both in your inbox and your mailbox. Uh, finally, the foundation annual lunch is next Tuesday. It will be held virtually uh, via uh, YouTube. So you will get a YouTube link sent to all of you. Encourage you to participate, and if you have questions, reach out before then. Um, that is my report. Okay, Thank Trustee you. Cross has a question or comment. Will we have to show proof of vaccine and or booster for some of the evening? Not that I'm aware of, Obviously but that, that, that <laughs> we, we would like you to wear a mask though, regardless. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. All in faith. No, that's not a vote. <laughs> that's not a vote. <laughs> Okay, other questions for Trustee Snyder on the foundation report? Thanks, Lee. Now we'll move on to the committee reports and recommendations. Collegial steering, we met on May 4th. Um, we had three, uh, three topics that we tried to look at. One is a wrap-up of 2021 and uh, what, what were people most proud of, what lessons were learned, and how to prepare for the next disruption. The second one was one or two things we thought could greatly impact student success, and then the third was more of a planning one about what collegial steering will look like in the fall of 2021. Um, there will be a different chair here in January of 2022, so that person will uh, be in a position to uh, figure, that, figure out what the, how they want to run collegial steering. Um, with respect to the wrap-up and, and lessons learned, I thought I'd share a few of them. I'm not going to say who, who told them. It's, this is a committee of faculty, staff, and trustees. Um, one, one was about the grace shown by students and the notion that if you give grace, you get grace. We talked about incoming student surveys where we're including a hope scale, which is something that um, helps indicate people's stick to I guess, and their willingness to, uh, and to, uh, their ability to be resilient uh, as long as we can give them hope. Improved accessibility through virtual meetings, which was good for not only faculty, staff, but also for students. Um, we heard about uh, the fact that we were prepared because we had done uh, disaster planning, not for a pandemic, but we had done disaster planning, and uh, that helped us as we moved into the new pandemic uh, situation. With new tools in our toolbox, um, there were questions or statements about missing hands-on teaching. Um, there was a comment about, you know, typically academia is said to move slow and be ponderous, uh, a great word. And this proved that in a crisis, we can move more quickly and we can learn from that. Um, no one size fits all. Some students need to be on campus. We need to meet students where they are. Um, and there was a comment I thought was interesting that COVID forced us to do things our own way because there was no model. And I know we, we always talk about how do our peers look? What do they do? What is it, what's working someplace else? Best practices, which I think is good. But I thought it was, it was kind of profound that there wasn't any model for this. Nobody had done it, and so we had to do it on our own. And some of the talent and creativity of Johns County Community College came through in that. Um, we talked about training in skills and interests, but making sure students are well-rounded. Um, this was in particular with respect to the culinary and, culinary and hospitality industry, because our teaching continued, but the industry is, is devastated. So, 
finding a place for those students to pivot to something else that would work, I thought was, a, was a, an interesting comment. And then there was a practical comment about how do, how do we reduce textbook costs as one of the barriers. I think our tuition, I've, I've said for a while, I don't know that our tuition is a big barrier given Pell Grants and others and the scholarship monies that we give out of about a million three a year. But books can cost as much as tuition in some, in some of the curriculum. Um, before I close, I want to thank our outgoing members, Diane Davis um, from the Faculty Association and Jamie Cunningham from the Educational Affairs Committee. Been very good. It's been a, it's been a, it's been a good year and, and had, we've had good discussions. So I want to thank them for their service and let them know they'll be missed in the fall. That's the Collegial Steering Report. The next item is the various items that came from the Committee of the Whole. I think we can move into that. Uh, the first recommendation is a modification to internal and external audit policies. It's on pages three and four of the Committee of the Report uh, discussion. And it's recommended changes to internal and external audit policies to clean up language within the policy and limit access to records necessary for an audit or investigation. Um, are there any questions about that before I ask for a motion to, to approve the recommendation of the College Administration to approve modification to the internal and external policy 210.05? Any questions? Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Moved by Trustee Cook and seconded by Trustee Ingram to approve the recommendation. Any discussion? And Trustee Lawson, you're going to have to shout out if you have it since I can't see you on the screen. I can't see if you raise you. your hand. but I'm free. good. Thank you, though. Feel free to do so. Okay. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Yes. aye. Opposed, no. That motion carries unanimously. The second report from the Committee of the Whole was to review changes to the open records policy 218.00. The recommended changes add the definition of public records to the policy and explain that Johnson County Community College is considered a public agency under the Kansas Open Records Act, sometimes referred to as, Co as CORA. It doesn't change any of the substance and certainly reflects our continued commitment to follow the state law. Um, it's a recommendation of the Committee of the Whole that the Board of Trustees accept the recommendation of the College Administration to approve the modification to the Open Records Policy 218.00 as shown on pages 5 and 6 of the agenda packet. Any questions or a motion to approve? So move. Second. Moved by Trustee Cook and seconded by Trustee Ingram. No, that was Trustee Smith. I'm sorry, Ever. Trustee Smith Ever. Okay. Going. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, aye. no. Motion carried. I do want to report that we, we have changed our, our methodology of bringing items to the board. And we have a once a month committee of the whole meeting where all the trustees um, hear all of these items in a committee setting that is also an open meetings, open meeting available by Zoom. And so as we go through these things, uh, please understand they have already been uh, discussed and presented and vetted at that Committee of the Whole uh, to which the public is invited. Uh, the next policy is a recommend, recommendation to modify the advanced standing credit policy. The recommended changes clean up language used in the policy and remove the requirement that students complete six hours prior to applying for advanced standing credit. This would allow students who may have three hours at some other in some other form to immediately have that credited to their transcript without completing six hours at Johnson County Community College. So it's a recommendation of the Committee of the Whole that we approve the college administration's proposal to modify the advanced standing credit policy 314.03. .03. Any questions or a motion? So moved. Moved. Second. moved by Trustee Smith Everett and seconded by Trustee Lawson. These are on pages seven through eight, seven through nine of your packet. Any discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. That motion carries. The next item for recommendation is the Renew Renewables Direct Participation Agreement with Evergy Inc. Um, this is, uh, somebody may want to. I think you skipped one. That's skip technology that. and communications. Policy. Okay. Top of the page. It's stressful being a quarterback. Top of the page. All right. That's on pages eight and nine. I misspoke <clears throat> before. 
The previous recommendation was only on page seven. So on pages eight and nine is a recommendation to add the definition of, to, to modify the technology and communication systems policy 510.00 to add the definition of communication systems, JCCC information and technology, and clean up language uh, throughout the policy. And this is intended to protect and explain clearly what you're allowed to use of Johnson County Community College technology and information and, and what you're not supposed to use. Any questions? If not, is there a motion to accept the recommendation to approve modification to the use of technology and communication systems policy 510.00 as shown subsequently in the board packet. So moved. Moved by second. Trustee Ingram and seconded by Trustee Lawson to approve the policy changes on pages eight and nine of the packet. Further discussion? Not all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. That motion carries unanimously. Now we get to the renewals direct participation agreement with Evergy Inc. And Randy, I didn't advise you ahead of time. Could you give us a quick thumbnail of this, yes. Dr. Weber? Yeah, you bet. Um, this is this is an agreement that we initially signed with Evergy just a couple of years ago, and it allows us to purchase um, renewable energy. And, and and the good news with this is is an update after reviewing the the uh, the usage that we have and we're producing a lot more through our own solar so our need to purchase will be less than initially anticipated so we're going to actually get a better rate with this agreement which is rare when you sign something later um, but this is a, a better rate to use less energy based on our commitment to solar over the last couple of years and this is this would be primarily the purchase of wind energy from them uh, the purchase of wind or other renewable energy and it's a 10-year contract at a lower rate than we previously enjoyed um, right we don't need to say that very often right, exactly <laughs> well we want you to say it more often um challenge accepted uh I remind people in the public that we are an all-electric campus it was designed that way and so it's all electric so electricity rates are very important to us and it's been very impressive how we have in our sustainability project have either reduced or lowered or, or kept or maintained our energy usage, our electrical usage, despite additional buildings and additional activity on campus. So thank you, Dr. Weber. Um, it is a recommendation then of the Committee of the Whole to accept the recommendation of college administration to replace the previous 10-year renewables direct participation agreement contract with Kansas City Power and Light, now Evergy, with a new 10-year renewables direct participation agreement contract with Evergy Inc. So moved. Second. Moved by Trustee Cross, seconded by Trustee Ingram. Further discussion? Mr. Chair. Yes, I, Trustee Ingram. Do you want to go ahead? Trustee Smith. Ever. I was just going to say, I think I second. Did you second oh. it? I did. Oh, okay. I, I heard stereo, <laughs> so it's always no worries. difficult. Well, sorry. Smith ever can have the motion and Trustee Ingram can have the motion. I, I, I think we're okay. I, <laughs> Trustee. Trustee Cook. Thank I, you, Mr. I, Chair. I, we're so, not fighting over this. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I'm completing 12 years on this board, and over those years, th this board has made uh, decisions uh, regarding and supporting the sustainability effort. The college has been recognized nationally several years throughout that time. Dr. Antel and others, the whole sustainable team, deserve a lot of credit for their leadership. And uh, sometimes when we, we make a motion to buy a different kind of light bulb or we put in different switches or we make some changes, uh, the public perhaps can say, well, that's a pretty expensive cost. And this is a good example tonight of what we're dealing with of, uh, of uh, using less wattage. And a lot of it's attributed to our overall sustainable program. But I just wanted to uh, thank this board for having the courage to support the administration, uh, faculty, and team uh, on sustainability to, t to take these actions. I've always said we ought to be a leader in various things, and this certainly is one example of how this college has been a leader to the county and the state. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jerry. Trustee when, Ingram. When I raised my hand earlier, it was to make several comments, but I have deferred to Trustee Cook, who has done such a wonderful job that I'm not sure that I can add anything in 
as, as a result of Randy Weber making some wonderful comments and Chair Cook, but I, I or not Chair Cook, Trustee Cook, excuse me. Um, but I do agree. I think it's really, it's just something that has permeated in the five years that I've been on the board. Um, you know, Olathe has a 21st century program that is sustainability. Um, you know, it's, it's very attractive to all of us, but I think particularly some of those students who will be attending the college in the coming years and to be able to talk about this program and what we do and what we have achieved, I think is just remarkable. So Trustee Laura Smith Everett, if you have some other comments to make, I didn't I, I mean to. Just, I thought I was just um, yeah. arguing about the second. So <laughs> <laughs> I thought he was calling you, me again. And no, no, no. So thank you. Trustee Cross, save me. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, it, it's nerve wracking being chair. Um, <laughs> I, I do commend the leadership of uh, Trustee yeah, Cook, here. Trustee Musel, and everyone I've served with for um, the focus on sustainability. And, and I think to Dr. Bound, who's helped continue that legacy, that it needs to be a part of our right. um, our planning and strategic uh, plan going forward. I, I know it will be. I'm just taking the time to grandstand a little bit and say I, I'm, I'm beyond proud of what we've done. And uh, though Trustee Musel and I argue a lot, this has been a point of agreement. And, uh, Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the chance to come. I commend everyone. I disagree that we argue very much. <laughs> oh, okay. Thank you, Trustee Cross. It is a credit to the entire uh, spirit of the campus that we have, we have put sustainability and renewable energy and those types of programs at the forefront of what we try to do. Okay, did we vote on that? Not yet. No. All in favor say aye. 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 Yes. Aye. Opposed nay. <laughs> no. Motion carries unanimously. Um, on page 12, we have three single source purchase reports. I don't know, I assume Kelsey is watching. I'm gonna take those all at once unless I hear otherwise from um, our legal counsel. The first one is for Sirius Computer Solutions in the amount of $275,000 for um, additional network and infrastructure products and services to support students, faculty, and staff during the COVID pa pandemic. Um, the second one is with Dell uh, for the purchase of $1.5 million worth of additional equipment. And that is purchased through the, the co-op that we have with other state, state entities so that we can buy at volume. And the third one is a recommendation for the, the purchase and installation of additional netting for the new soccer complex um, to present, pr protect from soccer balls ending up on College Boulevard. Are there questions about any of those single source reports? Not a question, but I appreciate your efficiency. Thank you. I would move their adoption. Second. Okay. Been moved by Trustee Cook and seconded by Trustee Ingram to approve all three single source items on page 12 of the agenda. Any discussion? Not all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed no. Motion carries. That takes us to page 14 and the Committee of the Whole recommendation to approve the low bid from A to Z Theatrical Supply and Service, Inc. on request for bid 21-044. These are dimming control upgrades um, in the Midwest Trust Center. Um, my rec it's a Rainier Center, the Nerman, Nerman Museum of Contemporary Art, and the Commons area, excuse me, buildings. My recollection from the Committee of the Whole is that our dimming system is so old that we can't find replacement parts, uh, which is the reason for this. It is a low bid from two bidders of $177,694 with a 10% contingency. So the motion should be to approve total estimated expenditures of $195,463 and 40 cents. Discussion or a motion? So moved. Second. Moved by Trustee Snyder and seconded by Trustee Cross to approve the recommendation for the low bid to A to Z Theatrical Supply Wait, and Service. This is the low Inc. bid? It is the low bid. Oh, okay. Yeah, I second. Uh, further discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, aye. no. That motion carries unanimously. On page 15 of the board <clears throat> packet is a, uh, an award of bid for five office renovations in four different buildings. Um, the renovations occur in CSB, Sustainability Office, MTC, Third Floor Academic Affairs and Legal Office, 
MTC second floor financial services office, library third floor renovation, and OCB second floor office renovation. At the Committee of the Whole, we learned that a lot of those are, are due to some of the movement that we had to put student services facing the public on the ground floor of buildings and moving administrative offices to upper floors of building, um, which is what part of this would accomplish. The low bid was for PARIC, P-A-R-I-C Corporation, $897,000 with a 10% contingency, bringing the total estimated expenditure to $986,700. Questions or comments? Trustee Cook. As we discussed, thank you, Mr. Chair. As we discussed in the Committee of the Whole, uh, I don't want the public to think these are just five individual offices. These are suites of spaces, so it's, it's, these are larger spaces than the traditional office. And uh, it, it is uh, due to uh, uh, delivering a better service to our students. So I wanted to make sure that people understood that. Good point. I know Dr. McLeod pointed out that the Academic Affairs Office will be uh, using less space than it did in its prior location. So um, sure. these are necessary as part of our uh, facilities master plan. All those in favor? Please, please have a question. If I may. Trustee Trustee Cross. Cross. I thank Trustee Cook for pointing that out because as we're going through some of these numbers, Trustee yes. Sharp used to always uh, stop and question some of the numbers justifiably. And um, I just wanted to point out, I think it's right. I, I missed part of the committee the whole, I apologize. But we have our professional staff go through these numbers and review these bids, and this is what, you're from Indiana, is that right? Yeah. From yes. completely not here? Yeah. So you, 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 you in part, and your staff made the decision to do this because it's the lowest bid for necessary things that we need on campus, right? That's correct. Okay, I just, I, it's pro forma, I apologize, but I just wanted the appearance of due diligence. That I asked something. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Further discussion? If not, all those in favor say yes. Yes. Aye. 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 Yes. Those opposed, no. I didn't try to trick you, trip you up. I tripped myself up with the aye instead of yes. But all right, we're now uh, to the probably the most important part of the, of the actions today, which is to a adopt a management budget for 2000, fiscal year 2022, which seems weird even to say. Um, for the public purposes, we will adopt a management budget today, allowing management to then issue contracts to faculty and other purposes. Uh, we will hold, we will publish the budget in July, and we will hold a public hearing in August. And here, Dr. Bounce, should I just turn it over to your chief financial officer? That'd be great. Rachel Lears. Rachel, thank you for being here in person. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, in addition to the materials that were included in the board packet, I do have just a few slides tonight to kind of inform our discussion on the adoption of our management budget for fiscal year 22. Um, so just jumping right into the slides here, um, and hopefully you all can see those. Um, this first item, this first slide, uh, is something that was shared at the Committee of the Whole meeting um, a couple of weeks ago, and this is simply um, the proposed, the administration's proposed budget for next year, fiscal 22, um, with general fund revenues of $165 million and proposed expenses of $175.1 million, um, which would be um, uh, a use of reserves in the general fund just north of $10 million. And I will point out again, Included in that um, capital allocation is a $15 million one-time expenditure for renovation of our science laboratories and classroom spaces. So that's the proposed budget of the administration. Um, to the right of that in the yellow column is a what-if scenario. And so at the budget workshop last month and at the committee of the whole meeting, there was conversation around um, a budget, what would a budget look like if we were to levy slightly less uh, property tax in fiscal 22? So um, that is the only number that's changed in the yellow column versus the proposed column, that being the property tax revenue. Um, the what if scenario contemplates a budget that would um, reduce the current mill levy rate by approximately a quarter of a mill. So that would be about $109.2 million in property tax revenue versus the proposed $111 million. So the difference is about $1.8 million. Um, and again, that's the only number that has changed in that what if um, budget scenario, the quarter mill versus the proposed budget, which is based on a tenth of a mill reduction. 
Um, at the committee of the whole meeting, we did have a, a couple of requests for some additional information, and I wanted to share that with you tonight. Um, this next slide uh, was taken from the Johnson County Appraiser's Office Revaluation Report, and this is issued each year in February. Um, this particular um, slide, we've gone back 10 years to show um, the uh, growth or the, the change in valuation that's generated by reappraisals and new construction. And so this is a data set that we've shared with the board in the past so that you can take that into account in your de um, decision making process as far as the college's uh, property tax revenue and mill levy rate. Um, again, from 2012 to 2020 on this chart, those figures are as of November each year, so those are the final um, final numbers uh, in 2021 again this was based on the February revaluation report and at that time um, the changes in valuation or the growth for calendar 21 was projected at 4.46 percent from reappraisal and 1.11 percent from new construction and I do think it's reasonable to assume that by the time we get to November of this year that reappraisal um, percentage will be lower uh, after appeals um, and other uh, potential exemptions are, are granted. But um, that's what that looks like. I know that piece of information was requested. I wanted to make sure that we shared that with you um, uh, in the budget discussion. Um, from there, we also um, have talked about uh, reminding everyone on the approximate um, mill levy factor. So we talk a lot about a tenth of a mill, a quarter of a mill, a full mill. What does that equate to? So just wanted to um, you know, really tried to simplify this and, and share this this evening. Um, again, when I talked about the proposed budget that the administration has put forward, that is based on a tenth mill reduction from our current levy rate. So that's going to reduce um, the property tax revenue for next year um, from the total amount uh, based on the current levy um, by about $1.1 million. In that what if scenario, that yellow column on the chart, um, a, a quarter of a mil reduction for next year would equate to $2.9 million off of the current rate. So again, that difference of about $1.8 million between those two, um, two budget scenarios. Um, from there, just simply following the math forward, then a half mil equates to about $5.9 million, and a full mil would be about $11.9 million in revenue to the college on an annual basis. So if you think about the college's tax levy right now, it's about 9.1 mils in total. Multiply that by that 11.9 million, you're going to get about 108, 110 million dollars in total revenue. That would be approximately our, t that's how you arrive at our total general fund budgeted um, property tax revenue for the, for the year. Um, also had some requests for additional uh, conversation or analysis on reserves. Um, because obviously these, these budget conversations and mill levy rates um, really tie in um, to our reserve levels, of course. And so this slide um, was presented in your budget workshop book. It was on page 75, if you remember, or if you have that with you. Um, again, this is our general fund reserve projection that's taken from our five-year projection model. This scenario is based on our proposed budget. The, um, 23 through 26 this fiscal years, um, those assume continued growth in valuation of 2 to 3 percent annually. Um, these, again, are very preliminary um, uh, estimates. This is, this is us just um, looking at um, what reserves could look like based on our uh, board policy, which says that at no time during our fiscal year does our reserve level go below 25 percent of our budget. Um, so obviously, the, under this um, projection, we are in compliance with the policy, or in excess of the policy, um, certainly. Um, but I did want to point out a few things when you're looking at these. Um, again, just reminders. The salary uh, amounts that are in next year's budget are based on a 1% increased uh, placeholder. So we have not um, concluded yet officially the contract negotiations with the Faculty Association. So any um, final salary ar arrangement um, that is different um, in excess of or lower than 1% um, would impact these reserve levels in, in the subsequent years. So keep that in mind. Um, also, after 2023, when we complete our commitment to the science lab renovations, 
There are no other additional capital, significant capital projects included in these numbers. So if we, um, when we uh, attend to our facilities master plan and, and updating that, um, you know, th those things may be incorporated later, but they are not in here to date. There are no other significant capital items included. Um, as well as our strategic plan. The strategic plan uh, has not yet been adopted. Any other um, initiatives or priorities that are identified through that process have not um, been, you know, costed out and, and identified and, and put into these financial projections either. So, um, again, the, the growth here um, is, is very preliminary. Uh, this next slide talks, the, the previous one was based on the, the reserves based on the proposed budget. This would be based on that what if scenario. So if we did a quarter of a mil reduction instead of a tenth, what potentially would the reserve levels look like, again, at the low point in the fiscal year, which is generally December 31st, based, based on the timing of when we receive our revenues. Um, again, if you look at this chart, um, you'll see that it, it grows. We've got the 2 to 3% growth assumed in those, those years 23 through 26, um, but still haven't captured um, likely um, some new expenses that we'll incur in those years. So again, still in excess of our policy, but these numbers are lower than they were based on the tenth of a mil. Okay, so just two more slides here on reserves. Bear with me. Um, this, these next two slides are, even though it is a year away, these are intended to illustrate the potential impact of Senate Bill 13. So we have talked about Senate Bill 13 and know that it will um, require the college to provide additional notice to taxpayers if we um, levy taxes in an amount uh, greater than a revenue neutral rate. So what I have done in these projections to give a little bit of a, a different lens here is to say if we took away that 2 or 3% growth in, in um, valuations and that growth in tax revenue, then what would our general fund reserve projections look like? So you see here, rather than growing um, over time between now and 2026, um, it's, it's much more of a flat um, uh, look over the next five years. So again, this would be based on the proposed budget for 22, but looking farther out uh, with neutral tax revenue for the next five years. And, and Rachel, yes. w when you talk about neutral, that means Stagnant status quo year to year. Yes. Okay. Yes. Same dollar amount in, in property okay. tax revenue frozen. Um, then the next. Oh, I went the wrong way. Sorry. This next uh, final scenario then on reserves would be that quarter mill reduction with the neutral or or level amount of tax revenue going out through 2026. So again, you can see, still would be um, in excess of the current policy, which is 25 percent of reserves, but. Again, these projections and those out years don't include what I think will be um, you know, some, some additional expenses uh, that, have, that we have yet to identify um, with regards to salaries, capital, and strategic plan um, specifically. So I wanted to share, share that um, upon request. And then I will um, really just close here by reiterating some of the considerations that we talked about last month during the budget workshop as far as things um, for, for the board to consider, things that the administration certainly considers when putting the budget together um, and thinking about our mill levy. And, and most importantly, I think um, legislative changes. We've talked about a lot this year. Um, we talked about Senate Bill 13 and the, the additional notice requirements that will be um, effective, again, not for fiscal 22, but for the year after fiscal 23. Um, but bearing in mind that whatever we adopt tonight uh, for fiscal 22 serves as the baseline calculation for those for those years um, and then the um, the dark store theory trustee Ingram and I talked again yesterday about the continued threat of of the dark store theory and the potential negative impact on the college's property tax revenue from changes in commercial property valuation methods so that's still out there um, of course, reserves, um, and we just went through a series of slides on reserves and want to make sure, again, that we're adopting a budget, um, a tax revenue amount, and the levy rate that will enable us to continue to manage our reserve funds um, to not only to support planned one-time investments, like the science lab renovations that we talked about, um, but also things that are planned, things that aren't in those charts, like the potential impact um, of, of negatively um, 
changing economic conditions um, or other unexpected circumstances, those kinds of things that we can't yet factor into a five-year projection model. Um, and also tying reserve levels again into um, the college's credit ratings. I mean, we know that currently the college enjoys very um, strong credit ratings from Standard and Poor's and, and Moody's. And if you if you read the reports that they the ratings reports that they issue or speak to the college's financial advisors, with, um, Piper Jaffrey, they they always refer to the strength of our credit and. Uh, the key factors in that include the board's ability to raise revenue, set tax rates, set tuition rates, um, and, and really maintain a healthy financial position for the college, which in those credit ratings in turn relate to our future um, cost of capital uh, as well. And then finally, the CFI score, we talked about that last month. We know that currently our CFI score is also very positive um, and indicates that we're in a, a great position to reinvest resources into the college. Um, to achieve our mission and fulfill our strategic plan priorities. Um, salaries and benefits, I talked about that. That's kind of a, a moving target yet in the budget. And then finally, strategic planning, and I mentioned that earlier, um, being able to ensure that we have resources adequate to uh, fund our strategic initiatives as they are developed and um, costed, if you will. Uh, remaining budget timeline, after tonight, we'll adopt the management budget, and then in August, as you mentioned earlier, Trustee Musil, we will hold our public hearing during the board meeting on the 19th. At that time, members of the public can come and address the board with any questions that they have about the legal budget. Um, and then from there, we will make sure that the documents are filed um, in compliance with the August 25th statutory deadline. So that's all I have for tonight. Um, take any final questions uh, that you might have. Trustee Cook. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, <clears throat> I guess I have uh, two or three points. One is that, again, I will say uh, it puts us at risk if we use non-recurring revenue, non -recurring revenue for recurring expenditures. I always think that's important. Uh, Senate Bill 13 is going to be uh, interesting. And, um, I, and at the same time, I do believe we need to lower the mill levy. Uh, staff has recommended a tenth, one-tenth mill. I'm looking at the Treasurer's report uh, that we'll deal with upcoming through March 31st, and we budgeted $28.7 million for tuition and fees, and through March we're at $25 million. Um, I'm not sure that we'll see an increase in the collection of tuition and fees in the next couple of months. Investment income, we budgeted at 600000 and we're at 181. We're a year ago to date. We're at $1.1 million. I'm not sure what happened, but we budgeted half what we were going to take in in investments. And while it's relatively a small amount compared to the whole budget, $500,000 is $500,000. So I think we just need to be cautious about not assuming that all of our revenue collections will be the same as they have been in the past. So I think we really need to be cautious about how much we reduce the mill and how much, but I do think we also need to lower our reserves. And I think you've done a nice job, Rachel, in explaining how we can do that. So I, I, I guess those are my thoughts, Greg. Thoughts or questions for Rachel, Trustee Snyder, <coughs> and then Trustee Cross? Well, I guess I don't have any questions. I've yeah. Proclamations, if you will, okay. but I, I no, can save fine. that if you'd like. Or have... I, I'm just going to let Rachel sit down if we don't have, if we don't think we have questions specifically. Trustee Cross, briefly, could could we request a copy of that? That was uh, absolutely a, a yes. wonderful presentation, and I thank you for uh, your analysis uh, and your service. I thank you. So I, I guess, Mr. Chair, I all have a question. Okay. Is my assumption correct that our interest income is way below where it was a year ago? Correct, and that's because um, the the rates that the college can obtain on the permitted investments that community colleges can hold in the state of Kansas are, are so low right now, um, especially in comparison to last year, like you noticed on the treasurer's report. Um, that is, that's that's what caused, has caused that decline in, in investment income. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Trustee Cross. And I thank Trustee Cook. I'm not tr trying to compete in any way. Uh, you said preliminary on the appraisals. Uh-huh. Rachel. Um, I think you're conservative in your your numbers, right? Two and three percent. Uh, that the two and three percent is the assumed growth in the five year projection model. Yes, I, I hope that it's conservative. It's I know. I, I'm not yeah. trying to set anything up. I'm just trying to 
ask. Like, we've seen greater numbers than that in Johnson County, right? In the past yes, five, definitely. Years. Yes. Um, I think are ridiculous, but I'm happy for them. Um, so you're, you're, you, you have conservative assumptions. Yes. But what do you mean by preliminary? Um, I, I just mean that those are, those are the preliminary assumptions we've used in a five-year projection model. It, without having any better information, um, those, are, those are what we feel like are appropriately conservative to, to use in a five-year financial projection. And I think um, Dr. Bowne or somebody else could, could help me with this. I don't understand the way Senate Bill 13 operates. So if we keep the mill the same and revenue goes up, that's a revenue, that's a non-revenue neutral position. So if we keep the mill wherever it is, or we, whatever, but we get, have increased revenues, that means we violated the revenue neutral requirement. Yeah, we'll so we'll have take, to take it back down to last year's level, and whatever mill levy that would justify, you have to vote to increase it. To take a dollar more than you did the last year, you'll have to right. basically increase the mill levy. I mean, so this is targeted to us, all of Johnson County, where we enjoy these increased I'm just saying yeah. that we're asking. I'm not trying to really cast any stone, but it seems that way. Um, I, I guess I want to ask you, maybe a subject for debate, and I don't mean to put this on you, but in all the financial news I follow, I, I think Trustee Lawson may disagree with me, but there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty right now in commercial real estate, um, as everyone is deciding when to go back. I know locked in where my wife works is going to go back July 21st. I think as more and more corporations realize they're paying a lot of money for leases, they're going to have to go back. But I think a lot of corporations on both coasts are realizing that we don't have to pay that. So it's possible, right? We, we, I'm asking you, we face uncertainty in terms of how the economy is going to play out in the next two years. Is Absolutely. that right in your analysis? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Oh, Trustee Lawson, do you have a question for Rachel? Sorry. Uh, yeah, no, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. So I heard that the assumptions that the valuations will drop, but so far through 2022, home sales uh, have broken records. Uh, I mean, 2021, uh, home sales have broken the records, and so have landowner sale prices. And that is going to be used to set the property tax value. So every month that goes by, that sets the appraisal rates for everything going for forward here. Uh, I, I guess I'm just confused because I've, I've talked about this every single time we've we've had these budget meetings. And is the college anticipating an implosion that the rest of the real estate does not see right now? I think she's anticipating two to three percent as the as the best information that our financial folks have. So it's yeah. not an implosion, but it's not the same rate we've grown over the last six years. Right, and and I just want to make sure that, that I'm clear that the increase in valuation that we have in the budget for fiscal 22 for next year is 4.5 percent and that's based on what we heard from the county appraiser that we scaled back for pending appeals and exemptions and all of that the two and three percent is what we've projected for 23 24 25 26 without having any better information just again like trustee cross mentioned a conservative kind of approach looking forward to it to a five-year projection model then the amount for next year's budget is four and a half Oh, okay. I just want to make sure that people are not saying that this is a housing bubble because this is not. This is a housing shortage. I know during the housing bubble, there were at least 3 million more homes than they are right now in the market and lending was very loose. So during a virus economy, lenders are very restrictive and uh, people are still getting approved. Uh, so many have learned from the mistakes of 2008. So I just want to make sure that these assumptions are not based on the idea that this is a housing bubble. Uh, and then should K through 14 become a reality that we're hearing at the federal level and it could be done through rescission in the U.S. Senate, so it wouldn't need a 60 vote more margin in the Senate, how would this impact us? Which, which legislation are you talking about? I said if the K through 14, so college, community college comes oh, part of K through 12, you know, how would this impact us? There's no real legislation. I, I think the, the short answer would be we would get the same tuition dollars because it's paying, our, paying tuition for students out of federal funds as opposed to us. So I don't know that it, it could affect us, I suppose, by bringing more students, yes. which would 
which would stress some of our, our, our you know, maybe the need for more faculty and more classrooms and, and that kind of thing. But as far as, so it probably affects us somewhat on the tuition side because we'd get more tuition dollars with more students. And on the expense side, there's a corresponding, you know, expense when we have more students on campus. Right, and, and for the sake of these projections, um, the concept of free community college has not yet been taken into account. Mm -hmm. So I think from the way I see it, it almost feels like uh, if, you know, setting a taxation for the level here being completely out of our control if, you know, K through 14 comes to reality, it might be smart to go in lower numbers so that the larger income taxpayers into this funding, something that, you know, the federal government can do and we cannot. So uh, I know a lot of these things are unknowledgeable and we don't really have a grasp on them at this point, but I think because they are significant factors happening at the federal level, that it's still something to consider. Uh, and then the talk of dark store keeps coming up, but that matters a great deal at the city and school district level, at the county level where we are. We see stores close in one area of the county and, and move to another. So in fact, we are seeing you know, a lot of growth in Western Johnson County and Southern Johnson County and slower growth in the Northeast core. So in the end, if Walmart closes a store in 75th and Quivera and reopens near DeSoto, it's a wash for the county. And so it's a net gain. So it's like, I don't understand the, why that keeps coming up because we are not at a city or a school district, but the county is, has very different impact for a dark store. I think the issue there is that we, we are countywide, which helps us if a store closes and opens someplace else, although we, we don't get a net gain from that maybe, but if all of the large stores are valued at 50% of what they're valued today, that will lower the assessed valuation of the county, and that means our mill levy will not raise as much money, and I think that's the dark store theory. It's not that a store is closed. It's that a store is valued for tax purposes as if it were vacant and on the market. And that's what Rachel and her team are guarding against, at least the potential that the assessed valuation of the county is harmed or the growth is slowed because those large stores end up with a lower valuation than they have traditionally had. Okay, so I'm just remembering um, Commissioner Ed Eilert had pointed the same argument out that I just spoke about, so I'm just trying to take that into consideration as we look at the arguments here. Uh, and in regards to commercial agents, uh, they are flooded. I, I'm not, not seeing what Trustee Cross is talking about as far as commercial slowing down. I mean, I was just on the commercial uh, national conference just this last week where you know there's a lot of discussions a lot of changes going on for industri industries and commercial uses and the different modes for housing and i'm in the mix of that so there's a lot of things that are coming so i'm just not seeing where these numbers are coming from and i'm trying to bring them to the table to say look this is this is different i'm in the i'm in the grind here and in the trenches and i'm saying something is different and I hope that uh, somebody's listening here. Um, may I, trustees, may I uh, let Rachel sit down? She will come back up, I know, if there are other questions. But yes. if we're going to discuss where we want to go, I think we have the information. Rachel, and I thank you for that. Sure, thank you. Other discussion? There will be at some point, Trustee Smith Everett. My questions are really around um, SB 13 and trying to get a really a black and white understanding of it. So if our, um, I guess what I'm still confused fuzzy on is the relationship between the mill levy and the revenue neutral requirement. So if we decide we, we are locked in starting next year with the revenue that we are pulling in and any additional revenue if we do not want to claim that, what happens? What do we do as a college? Here, here's what I understand, and I, I was trying to do some math. Using what's on page 16 with a 0.1 mill levy reduction, we would have ad valorem property taxes of 111 million next year. If the following year, the appraised value in the county went up by 5%, 5% 5 of 111 is probably about 
five and a half million dollars. We, we would have to roll our mill levy back by about half a mill, yes. since we take about a little over 11 million with one mill, we'd have to roll back to 8.6 mills. And if we wanted to take a dollar more than that 111 million, we'd then have to raise the mill levy. Okay. So if we wanted to take the entire 5% assumed appraised value increase, we would have to raise the mill levy by half a mill to get back to 9.1 to take all of that increase. And a mill levy is $1 of tax per $1,000 of valuation. It's, a, it's an absurd, arcane way of dealing with property taxes, but that's the way we have to do it. Uh, my view is, regardless of what we, have to, what we do tonight, we are, going to have, we are going to be forced by Senate Bill 13 to vote on an increased mill levy next year. Um, given, given all the circumstances that we have, including what we'll learn later in the negotiations, um, we're going to need more than $111 million next year, or $109 million if we reduce the mill levy by 0.25 this year. We're going to need more than that next year, and we're going to have to raise, vote to raise the mill levy after it's artificially reduced mm -hmm. to be revenue neutral, if that makes sense. So, and mail notice oh. to every taxpayer. That's, yeah. Yeah, yes. mm -hmm. yeah and I, you probably couldn't hear Rachel on the, on the Zoom, but... Um, if, if we intend to take an extra dollar, notice has to be sent to every taxpayer in Johnson County, and then we have to hold a separate or a public hearing to allow people to come in, as we do with every year with a public hearing, uh, to talk about that increased mill levy to take any additional dollars. So that, that's the process that we have next year, unless next year's legislature changes it, which I doubt. So we're, we're stuck with that process, and I don't, I don't want to, I've got comments later about Senate Bill 13, but I don't want to run from that in doing the right thing on the budget. Dr. And if, I, if I could add, so you're talking about if we were to keep, the, go to attract the additional, uh, capture the additional $5 million. If we were to say, you know what, next year we only want to capture $3 million out of that five million, five and a half million, we would still have to be, even though it's less than what the increase in valuation is, and therefore tax dollars, we would be still asking for an increase, but at a lesser amount. So even though we're asking less than historic practice around mill levy and, and the rate, uh, we'd be asking for less. We're still asking for more. The only way you're not asking for more is if you cap it at the whatever it is this year. Justy Cross. Yes, and just, just to learn this point, I mean, don't we already kind of do this already anyway? I mean, except the mailing out yeah. bit. Like, we, we, we give notice every year that yes. we're, we're going to do something with yeah. the budget, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Am I following? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. So for a lot of people that hate government, this sure seems like make work for government. This is to ensure <laughs> that if you want to take another dollar out of the growth in the county, you vote to increase your mill levy to do so. So we're just wasting staff time doing... It's a math. It's a math and a political issue. All right. All right. Thank you. Uh, other comments on? I think. I think what we heard from the committee of the whole is that the administration's recommended a 0 0.1 mill levy increase. That's correct. Decrease. Uh, 0.1 mill levy decrease. There you go. Um, and there was discussion about uh, a 0.25 mill levy decrease that Rachel pointed out in other slides. Um, so I think those are probably the alternatives. Uh, for us tonight, and I, I, I suppose we ought to speak to those, and I don't expect to have a motion first, but if anybody has comments on those two as alternatives, Trustee Snyder. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, at the Committee of the Whole, I, I uh, expressed an interest in, in going to a quarter mil reduction, if not more. Uh, still tonight, um, I, I support a quarter mil reduction and, and would be happy to make that motion at the appropriate time. Would like to explain my thinking on that. Uh, when I started, or not necessarily started, but, but certainly uh, started investigating the college's budget in 2017 in anticipation of running for this seat, uh, we, we received $90 million in property tax revenue, $90.5 million. And uh, as it's been mentioned, we are set, even with a reduction, to receive $109 million next year. That, that is an extraordinary 
increase in property taxes that no jurisdiction across the country would generally plan on, on receiving. There are a lot of people that went through the past, I guess, 14 months now uh, and came through it absolutely fine. But there are a lot of people in our county that are, are really struggling with different issues. And when I look, and I know colleagues uh, you know, around the county, certainly legislators in Topeka, look at our, our reserve levels, that is why we end up with things like Senate Bill 13, in my opinion. And so we need to do something to flatten it. I think the quarter mill reduction flattens that at an appropriate level. Um, we, as we've had numerous conversations at different times on this board, uh, we have a, a heavy dependence in our budget for with property tax, I think roughly 67%. I don't know what, what this reduction would, would do. I don't expect it would change that trajectory a whole lot. But the state has continued, thankfully, knock on wood, to provide investments uh, for higher education. Not related, but we, we certainly have federal CARES money that has come into this college. We still have $6 million in capital outlay mill levy funds that we approved two months ago. So we have funds that continue to come into this college that can, uh, in my opinion, carry on the day-to-day -day operations and, and meet the needs of what we need from a capital investment. It's, it's great that we have reserves to do things like science projects, science renovations. Uh, reserves are, are not necessarily designed to, to be a capital spending savings account. It, it's great when that occurs, and, and maybe there's a small portion, but, but ours has gotten too heavy, and I think this is a, a reasonable way to move forward. As Trustee Lawson highlighted, I, I, I don't believe valuations are going to go down. If anything, I think they're going to continue to go up, and we're going to have robust uh, ability to, to raise revenue. Uh, I will commit, uh, if I am fortunate enough to be back here next year, I am fully prepared to, to vote to um, adjust our mill levy so we get the resources we need and, and not be hamstrung by, by Senate Bill 13. So th those are my, my thoughts. I think I covered everything that I would like to cover, and those are my rationale so that when we have an opportunity to, to make a motion, I'll be making that motion. Trustee Cook. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, <clears throat> I, I would remind us that 79% <clears throat> of our expenses are salary and benefits, and I appreciate your comment about the capital outlay fund. I, I don't want the public to think that that can be used for anything. That is to be used only for capital outlay. Uh, I, I wouldn't want to put too much of a burden on our operating expenses of salary and benefits in operating. Uh, again, I, I guess I go on 12 years. Uh, I have the highest regard for our staff and uh, the work that uh, Ms. Lears does along with her teammates. Uh, the administration has come with a recommendation of a 0.1 mill levy reduction. I'll support that rather than the 0.25. Uh, and I think they have said we could, we could probably get by with the 0.25, but this college has had those reserves and has had the great financial standing with all of our agents because of the great work that our team does. So I'll be supporting the staff budget recommendation of 0.1 mill levy decrease. Anybody else want to make a comment before? I can't stop anybody from making a motion anytime they want, so don't think I'm trying to do that. <coughs> but I thought we'd have a discussion first. Trustee Cross? I'll go. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I thank uh, Trustee Cook uh, for his, his comments and, uh, frankly, analysis of the Treasurer's report. It's, it's keen insight, and I appreciate you pointing out the things that you do. Um, Gallet Ventura Rosen of Forbes uh, wrote an article on March 19th of 2021. Uh, sh this person is a real estate broker in Las Vegas, and her conclusion and this is my observation <clears throat> shared among other people in uh, uh, the comment on commercial real estate. Final takeaways, as a result of the pandemic, there's still a tremendous amount of uncertainty regarding the commercial real estate market. 
However, despite the pandemic, uh, numerous investors continue to be involved in the market, though problems related to site visits, assessments, and contract signing often delayed the process, as was common in the pandemic. There's still sa stable CEO CRE sectors that have continued to perform well that investors should look at to forward, look forward to and in investing in. These include e-commerce, warehouses, self-storage facilities, some store, grocery stores, and medical retail spaces. And I think that squares with what Trustee Lawson has said, that there will be opportunities in, in this market. So even after the pandemic, these spaces will continue to flourish. I, I'm merely stating that there's uncertainty. And, um, you know, I've said some of this before, but, you know, generally as we enter in our second uh, half century of existence here, that, that we should continue to reinvest any additional funds in our uh, student, faculty, and staff. Uh, $10 million for College Promise, I mean, that, that's really exciting, uh, but I think that we should perhaps in the radical move consider letting some of those pitches go by, let our sister schools that are dying on the vine, as some mentors here and other colleagues have told me, uh, they need the money and I think we should start our own College Promise. And the difference between 0.25 and 0.1 alone is a start, let's say. So I generally oppose any cut to the mill levy because I do think we, we should reinvest in the college. Uh, specifically, the extra tax revenue should go to lower tuition or, or strengthen our move to a cost-free community college for all, or at least at a at last dollar effort. Um, a majority of the remaining balance should be used to compensate our faculty and staff as they are on the front lines and directly help produce uh, our greatest product here at JCCC, and that's our students. Uh, I, I think in this time where we, I think in part, based on my knowledge, and, and none of you really hesitate in correcting me, I think we relied on the reserves last year. So we're coming uh, post one of the greatest um, crises that we've ever managed in this country, and we're talking about cutting the reserves. I get that that needs to happen. I get that the optics uh, are that we need to do something. Uh, but I, I, I share Trustee Cook, and I appreciate Trustee Cook's positions here tonight greatly because I know a great deal of thought went into them, having served with him eight of those 12 years. And uh, I, I share his, my, my perceived, um, my perception of his thoughts that, that we should be cautious in what we do. Um, you, you know, I, I know next year is, is an election year in Kansas. Um, I worry about the return of a conservative gubernatorial administration it was not easy governing this place uh, the first few years I was here when Governor Brownback was here. And Governor Collier, I think, faces the very real possibility of winning next year. Uh, I'm, I may be early, and I don't mean to be an alarmist, but I think that's real, and I frankly support our current governor. So I, I think any surplus we have should be generally go to reinvest in the college, support our students, faculty, and staff, and the infrastructure that we have uh, for our next 50 years. Um, a couple of the points. Uh, hang on, please, and let Trustee Cross finish. I'm inclined um, to support the point one, uh, nevertheless, uh, but I wanted to make these uh, positions known. And uh, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, reserving the right to any additional comment, I thank you for the time. Thank you. Trustee Lawson, you have your hand up. Uh, thank you. So I just want to make sure that I don't know who that was that just made that comment, but, that, but that's um, unfortunate because I was paying attention to Trustee Cross and what he was saying is, uh, my comment says, as you know, many of you, I have spoke and argued for very steep mill levy reductions. Uh, the reason for this is many and fold, of course. First, I believe that the future of the community college will be different. Uh, no matter what happens, more students will be looking to educate at home and the era of big building construction is largely over. Second, our reserves are so healthy that upkeep plus faculty are there. Uh, we've already got that in the budget. We're already doing that. And there's not plans to really bring out a second master facility plan. So all of that is done. Reserves, as uh, Trustee Snyder said, isn't a savings account, but the bigger problem is more the reserves, the more the temptation it is to spend it away when it's not needed. And I think we can do better. I think I've said this many, many, many times. I think the money goes back to the taxpayer, gives our employees and residents a chance to live in Johnson County. 
And a few years ago, the average sale through this Johnson County prices were 250,000 for a home. And uh, just was a few months ago, the Kansas City Star article noted that the average sell through the value over one year is now 500,000. So new home builders are asking minimum 400, 500 just to get into the door. And by the time you close, it's an extra $150,000 for unexpected cost and supplies. There's a revolution about what is changing and how we're building these houses, where we're building these houses, and building out in vacant lots. So there is big changes that are happening and coming. I view the quarter as minimum, minimum. And I, I will join Trustee Snyder in a second unless someone else offers something else. But of course, to Trustee Cross's mention about Las Vegas, this is Kansas City. Uh, which deals with a lot of rail yards uh, and average pass-throughs looks at commercial property far differently than cities who live and die on convention centers and casinos. Um, I you know, appreciate Trustee Cross for recognizing the difference. Uh, this isn't optics. I'm not running for office. I, I don't have anything to gain in, in rolling back the mill. I'm doing this to, to make sure that the college is nimble for the future ahead. So I second Trustee Snyder in at minimum, the quarter mill rollback. Okay. Um, I guess I'll weigh in and then see if we have a motion. Um, last year, I think both Trustee Snyder and I were looking to roll back the mill levy, at least some. And because of the uncertainty of the pandemic and um, pretty urgent pleas from the administration to, to hold, hold the course, um, we, we stayed the course and kept the mill levy where it was. Um, this year, I appreciate the recommendation of point one, but I think we can safely do point two five. Um, I think next year, regardless, we're going to have this, whoever's on this board will have to have the courage um, to vote to raise the mill levy. And I think you will have to have the courage to do it every year because you simply can't stay at the same place when 70%, I think you said 79, Jerry, 70% of our expenditures are salary and benefits. Um, so if you're 70% there and you're an ele all electric campus with rates going up and everything else, there's Mr. no Chair, way you can Mr. survive. Chair, yeah, it's 79, just, just to make well, sure if you're you, correct. If you look at the chart, I believe it's 52% um, salaries and 18% um, benefits. Is that right, Rachel? So 70 is the total. I apologize. I was just yeah. trying to make you correct. That's all. Yeah. The, I mean, I looked at that when Jerry said 79 because I thought it was 70. Uh, I was just looking at our treasurer's report, and through March, it's 79 percent. Okay. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. As part of the, as the budget, it's 70 percent in the revenue chart that we saw. Um, so we're going to have to raise the mill levy every year, probably, um, even even if the even if the economy continues to grow. So I I, I think. You know, the fact that we don't have any significant on the horizon capital expenditures, because we knew last year that we had science labs we had to do. Barbara Larson, our senior VP for business, told us that three years ago we had 25 to $30 million coming. And that's part of the reason we built up our reserves, so we could spend those out. Um, and I agree, Trustee Snyder, it shouldn't be a, an account just for capital expenditures. What it allows us to do is not borrow. Our, our debt load at this college is very low, even with the $50 million that we, 50, 55 million we borrowed for the facilities master plan, we still have a very, very low debt load and a very, very low interest rate. So we don't have significant capital expenditures coming, coming for in, in, in the next couple of years. Um, credit ratings and financial ratios are important, but um, I think what I would look for next year is show us where we are on the financial ratios with various scenarios. Uh, number one, and show us uh, what our credit rating, what our credit rating, not only what it might be by our credit rating agencies, but also does that mean we pay uh, 100 basis points more or 50 or what the actual impact is? Um, I'm going to throw something out that I think may fly in the face of some other theories, but I think we need to look at a tuition increase because I, I think Trustee Cross is right. I don't think we're gonna get more money from the state um, as far as the over, overall percentage of the budget. And if you look at it, the state is at its lowest percentage in 10 years, 
14 percent. This is the, this is the information that was submitted yesterday. Our tuition is at its lowest percent of the budget at 17 percent for next year that it's ever been. Um, and I, we haven't we've raised tuition one dollar over the last once in the last six years. That was four years ago. Um, I don't think tuition keeps people out of here. I think other costs that we need to get a handle on um, are what are barriers to students to come here. And I think the promise programs um, coming potentially from the state or from the federal government, whether the last dollar or first dollar, are going to help help us in that sense and help students come. Um, but all in all, we, we can give another, as I understand it from Rachel's slides, $2 million in property tax relief by going from 0.1 to 0.25. Um, and we will still not threaten our reserve ratios under the scenario she projected, um, which, I, which I do think is conservative. And uh, as to Senate Bill 13, I, I, I brought the last four years budget books that I could find in my files. And I just want to tell the public, in every one of these, there are charts and there are tables that show exactly how much money we were going to take in last year and the new budget year. And it explains what the mill levy means and how much more money we get when assessed valuation goes up. So I, I just want to make it clear from a transparency standpoint, Senate Bill 13 doesn't do anything, as you mentioned, T Trustee Cross, we haven't already done, except send out notices and force a vote to raise the mill levy. Um, and I, I'm willing to do that. I also, on Senate Bill 13, I have to say it, uh, I looked it up earlier. State of Kansas gets 20 mills. It's had a 20 mill levy for K-12 education since the early 2000s, I think. Um, since, since 2011, the overall state assessed valuation has gone from $184 billion to $238 billion. So that's a 30% increase. The state has taken every dime of that. I don't begrudge them that. It supports our schools, but they act like we have been somehow taking it inappropriately, even though we have shown it every year in our budget and have voted on, it, voted on our budgets every year. And the legislature simply takes 20 mils, and if, the, if we increase valuation because Johnson County Community College helps the economy in, in Johnson County, they take it. And Senate Bill 13 doesn't apply to them. Um, that's a long way of saying, I think we can afford it. I think it's the right thing to do, and I will support a 0.25 mill levy decrease. Mr. Chairman, if appropriate, I would move that we adopt the FY22 management budget with the quarter mill reduction as presented tonight. Is there second. a second? Second. Moved by Trustee Snyder and seconded by Trustee Lawson to approve the budget with the scenario of the 0.25 mill levy decrease. Um, we've all had a chance. Anybody have any other discussion on that before, or any question about it before we see where the votes are? Uh, Mr. Chair, just a comment about the tuition thing. I would actually be interested in a tuition increase on the out district, and I could join you on that in later discussion if this is something that has to come up. Uh, but to help our fellow community college members in the outside districts, but doing so in district, I don't feel as helpful, but that's my comment on that one topic. Yeah, I, I'm not putting that on the table now. I'm just suggesting that after six years and having tuition revenue being a smaller percentage of our budget, that means taxpayers are paying a bigger lug every year. Uh, property taxpayers in Johnson County are paying a bigger lug every year. Further, further discussion? I would just note, you, you mentioned this in your comments, but the, the difference between the, the 0.1 and 0.25 mil reduction is $1.8 million. That, that is the amount of money we're contemplating giving back to taxpayers in recognition that our reserves are at an appropriate amount and will continue to grow, and this college will, will continue to grow. My, my last comment would be, I, I mentioned, we're going to have to have the courage if the college can justify it, to vote for a mill levy increase each year, we're also going to have to have the courage to say no to spending so that we can find a way to bend the curve of the cost of higher education. Because as, as Trustee Snyder pointed out, the amount of new dollars we've gotten every year that I've been on this board 
um, is dramatic. And I, I will remind people, I think the uncertainty part is good, and I think this is part of Dr. Bounds' comments. In fiscal year 10, 11, and 13, the, the assessed valuation in the county went down. So we're, we're assuming a two to three increase. I think we can adjust to that, and that's why we have our reserves at the levels they are. Trustee Cross, did you have a, another comment? Yeah, I, um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I certainly appreciate that this uh, college has uh, kept, kept tuition fees frozen for the past six years. It was something I campaigned on and, and advocated for, and I appreciate the previous administration and this board's position on that. I, I just think, um, in all seriousness and, and civility, it, it's somewhat hilarious that some of you want to cut the mill and then go run for college promise money. So I think that, um, you know, you, you create interesting situations for us when you want to cut the mill and then go ask the state for money. So I, you know, with all due respect, and I, I think your positions are reasonable based upon the, the forecasts and, and Rachel's wonderful conservative estimates, uh, Vice President Lear's, but I just, I just respectfully disagree, and um, I want to make that point. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Trustee Ingram. Just to clarify, you were saying no matter which mill decrease, the 0.1 or the 0.25, that there will be a reason that we have to ask for an increase in the mill. I, I'm, I'm predicting that. Yeah. We will either have $111 million next year as our base or $109 million. Okay. And with uh, the anticipation of the bargaining agreement mm -hmm. and addressing staff salaries, we are going to need dollars more than that. Mm -hmm. And any one dollar more than that means they right. have no levy right. increase. Right. Uh, now, it'll be a bigger increase if we cut more, maybe. And so that's a consider. I'm not ignoring that as a consideration. Right. But I just, I just don't think going forward, unless the entire country is in a recession, that we are going to be in a position where we won't need one more dollar more next year than we did this year. That, that's my that's my prediction. That, you know, I'd be glad to be wrong. Mr. Chair, I just have a question about the comment uh, that there's a conflict between uh, college promise and mill levy rollback. Can Trustee Cross explain what he means? How is this a conflict? Trustee Cross, are you? I, I have nothing more to add. I, okay. I think it speaks for itself. I've got it. Okay. I just don't feel like it's at odds, so I disagree. All right. Um, nobody has called the question, but I'm going to um, call for the vote. All those in favor of the motion? Well, I think we probably ought to vote by roll call on this because I don't, I, I don't know where we're going to go. So let's, I'm going to call, call the roll, and I'll go by officers and seniority. Trustee Snyder? Aye. This is on a, on a 0.25 decrease. Uh, Trustee Cross? No. Trustee Ingram? No. Trustee Cook? No. Trustee Lawson? Yes. Trustee Smith Everett? No. Chair votes aye. The motion fails four to three. Is there another motion? Someone I would like move to that we adopt the budget proposed by the uh, administration of a 0.1 mil levy decrease. Second. Moved by Trustee Cook and seconded by Trustee Cross to adopt the recommend, basically adopt the recommendation of the administration, which would include a 0.1 mil levy decrease. Any discussion on that point? Can I ask for a friendly amendment? You, you can ask for a friendly or you can offer an amendment. Okay, can we meet in the middle? <coughs> Trustee Cook. Trustee Cook is shaking his head no. He wants to stick with the point one. Okay. There's no further discussion. Um, I guess we'll do a roll call again. Trustee Snyder. Aye. Trustee Cross. Yes. Is it yes? I'm going to make sure that's recorded. I heard. Uh, aye. Yeah. Uh, Trustee Ingram. Yes. Trustee Cook. Aye. Trustee Snyder. Trustee Smith Everett. Yes. I knew it started with an S. And Trustee Lawson, I got you out of seniority order. <laughs> hey. Uh, no. Okay. That passes six to one with Trustee Lawson voting no. This, this is a management budget. 
in, at the July meeting, we will vote on a budget to publish for public hearing in August. And in August, we will vote on a final budget that will be then used for fiscal year 22. And that mill levy will actually be finalized in November um, by the county treasurer once all of the appeals and other things are in. But for now, we have a management budget to go forward. Uh, Dr. Bann, do you have any comments? I just want to say thank you very much uh, to your trustees. Uh, I appreciate the, um, the passionate and hearty discussion and the different perspectives. Um, our job as uh, college leaders is to prepare a budget uh, for you that addresses the needs of our college, moving us forward to increasing student success as we proceed. And I just want to thank you, trustees, um, for approving the management budget tonight, and we'll prepare the final budget, uh, uh, the official budget for you for July. Okay. Thank you, and Rachel, thank you and your team uh, for a lot of hard work Absolutely. in answering tough questions um, from trustees. We appreciate it. Uh, the next item on the agenda is the treasurer's report. Trustee Cross, our treasurer. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the trustees, the treasurer's report can be found in the board packet. And um, the report for the month ended March 31st, 2021, includes some items of note on page one. The, the, post, the general post-secondary technical education fund summary, March was the ninth month of the college's 2020-21 fiscal year. The college's general fund unencumbered balance, cash balance was $105 million as of March 31st, 2021. An ad valorem tax distribution of $3.5 million was received in March and recorded as follows. Uh, for the general fund, $3.3 million, a special assessment fund of $13,097. Capital outlay fund received $194,269 for a total of $3.5 million. Also, during March, the college made a semi-annual debt service payment on the series 2017 Certificates of Participation. Uh, the expenditures in the primary operating funds are within the approved budgetary limits. And uh, before I make the recommendation, uh, Mr. Chair, I just wanted to uh, thank you uh, and uh, everyone for the civil tone and, and your, your leadership in what's been a difficult series of meetings, and I don't mean it in any um, uh, unprofessional way, I appreciate your leadership. It is the recommendation of the college administration uh, that the Board of Trustees approve the Treasurer's Report for the month ended March 31st, 2021, subject to audit, and I so move. Moved by Trustee Cross to accept the Treasurer's Report ending March 31 for subject to audit. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Trustee Ingram. Is there any discussion? If not, all in favor say yes. Aye. 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 Opposed, no. The treasurer's report is accepted uh, subject to audit. Uh, I'm going to go back because I, I believe I completely forgot to get a motion and a second on page 15 for the office renovations, which we talked about. Um, but it's been suggested there wasn't a motion and a second. Does anybody remember if they moved and seconded that, or should we? Let's do it again. So moved. Moved by Trustee Cross. Second. Seconded by Trustee Ingram to adopt the recommendation of the administration to award the low bid to Peric Corporation for request for bid. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries unanimously. I do remember reading it as if there was a motion in a second, but I'm not sure I did it. So we did it twice. They still only get paid once. <laughs> okay, President's report, Dr. Bam. All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. And again, I also... I uh, want to thank Rachel and our team, the financial services team, and frankly, our budget managers across the college for the significant amount of work that goes into preparing the budget uh, for our consideration and then, frankly, managing it throughout the year um, to uh, ensure the best possible support for students and our faculty and staff and community. All right, to jump into my report, um, I am going to uh, move uh, as quickly as I can through this. The good news is uh, we've already covered the first two items on, the, uh, on my agenda for my report for you for today. Um, so we're going to jump right into it from there. You had a chance to meet Callie, a uh, fine, fine uh, student for us here. 
So I want to get in. We talked about College Promise already. What I wanted to do uh, quickly today is just give you a snapshot of where we at from, uh, because it is uh, commencement season. I uh, wanted to give you a sense of where we are from a completion standpoint. Um, and I don't know if we can um, change the view on the, um, uh, of the participants down to a single. Um, so there we go. Or just slide it over. There we go. Um, anyways, I wanted to give you a sense of kind of where we're at, realizing that the numbers for this year, the far right column, 2021 uh, total uh, number of, of degrees and uh, certificates, realize that those are preliminary numbers based on uh, those who have a Summer and fall are, are solid numbers. The spring numbers are based prior to graduation audit. And so um, anyways, when I look at that to give you a sense, um, this would point us in the direction of about 3,000 students graduating with either an associate degree um, or, or a certificate. Um, when I look at, you'll see that there's a, uh, well, you won't see that because you're only seeing one year's worth of data. But if you look at the certificate number, that isn't that is down noticeably over last year. Last year we had about 1,300 um, certificates that are awarded, that were awarded. Um, the primary areas that we've seen a, a decrease um, are in three areas that account for about half of the decline in certificates from this past year: CNA, our police academy graduates and our EMT graduates. And again, much of this is due to COVID, um, particularly in, in the area of, of CNA and being able to get clinical placements and so forth for them. Um, so we've reduced class sizes this year, which resulted in a significantly lower number of certificates. Um, we're hoping that those asterisks are there um, and that um, as we move forward that those numbers will rebound, but certainly, um, you know, we saw a decline, um, you know, at the tail end of the spring semester last year, those who went through from classes and so forth related to COVID, and then our enrollment has been down between 7 and 8% this year. Um, when you look at that, that to me is also a contributor more to the um, decline in certificates than it is uh, perhaps on the associate degree um, side of the equation. So... Um, I, I, before we get real excited about these numbers, because I will say this at this point in time, um, you know, our associate degree awards are higher than they were last year, but our students have to go through the audit pro graduation audit process that doesn't happen until after the semester is done and all final grades are submitted and so forth. So that number is likely to move downward. Uh, in addition to that, I wanted to talk real quickly about summer and fall plans. Um, I will say just very quickly from a summer uh, enrollment standpoint, we're up 4% in headcount and 1% in credit hours. Um, remember, we, are, we started the registration process 15 days earlier than we did last year. So it's, it's when we, we can compare date to date, there's a 15-day gap on you know, head start this year compared to last year. So... Um, while our numbers are up compared to last year, um, we're seeing that gap start to close. Um, when, when we look at, we've, we talked about, and, and uh, Dr. Liker referenced this earlier today uh, in our meeting, the plan is for all employees who are scheduled to work um, on campus to be here uh, beginning June 7th. Um, and, and so we will continue to work through uh, you know, the, the ever-evolving um, uh, guidelines that come either from a, a local or state standpoint and now with CDC um, changes that are happening as we speak, well, not as we speak, but happening today already. Um, continuing education for summer um, is about 51% of their courses will be offered, programs are offered uh, in person and 48% are live online, synchronous online. Um, and they, they're offering about 657 courses uh, this summer. Uh, they, their enrollment as of date is over 1,800. 
Um, that's down from two years ago, but boy, is that dramatically up over last year. Um, our summer term here on campus will be a very typical looking summer in terms of of, of uh, being predominantly face to face, excuse me, predominantly online courses um, over the summer. As we look to fall, um, uh, and, and we referenced it in the communication earlier this week, um, we are um, certainly looking at increasing capacity in our courses by reducing um, distancing. Um, you know, as, as recently as today, as I mentioned, the CDC guidelines are changing. Um, and those are going to be the, the, the complexities that we will need to manage through over the summer um, as we prepare to meet student needs. Um, certainly the opportunity to offer more face-to-face in-person classes um, to meet student demand is a, uh, something we're working through as well. Um, we will continue to offer a robust set of online and hybrid courses to meet the needs of students that are seeking those options. But we also want to make sure that we're able to meet the needs of students who want to come to campus for their courses, for services, for involvement in clubs and organization. And so there's lots of work that needs to happen between now and the start of fall semester. Um, and uh, I know our team uh, of faculty and staff are up to the challenge. Um, this, the um, second to last item on my uh, report is uh, last year, uh, just short of a year from uh, a year ago, we were having, you were having discussions about Juneteenth. Um, and the, the group um, from faculty development, staff development, and student life um, are working on a strong set of programming for us to celebrate and recognize Juneteenth. Um, they are working on, I'm not gonna say who it is yet because they're finalizing an agreement with a, a national level speaker to come in and um, it will be a name that you recognize. Let me just put it that way. Um, um, as we um, prepare for a, a, a night of programming on the 14th, um, including faculty, staff, and students. Um, we'll also be recording that and making that available for those who can't <coughs> attend. We'll be using uh, our communication strategies internally with InfoHub and other sources to make sure that we're communicating. Where are the opportunities, not only for us as a college, but across the community to engage in deepening our understanding um, and uh, honoring uh, Juneteenth. Our history faculty are working to create um, a Canvas module that faculty across the college can use um, in their summer courses and beyond, but particularly for summer courses um, to help students understand uh, the significance and importance of Juneteenth. And then finally, um, uh, our, our faculty um, are uh, developing uh, in concert with Student Life um, uh, a set of programming, including a trivia contest um, that will be providing information, feeding information out to our students, but then also giving them the chance to participate and test their knowledge as they continue to learn. Um, and so this is, um, you know, as you think about our discussions over this year, um, uh, the outcome of, of previous discussions was we would this year take on additional programming um, from a cultural development standpoint, and so this is the plan for um, this year. Last slide um, is I want to thank um, uh, our faculty and staff um, for um, working their way so well through an incredibly challenging year. Our faculty and staff and our students um, we couldn't do it without the innovative spirit of our faculty and our staff um, to find new ways to meet the needs of our students. Um, the way we deliver courses, the way we deliver services um, uh, is, is greatly appreciated. To our IRT and return to campus teams, our facilities teams have really done a fantastic job of of ensuring that we have protocols that for all intents and purposes did a pretty good job of keeping each other safe during an incredibly challenging year. Um, I want to thank you as trustees for your leadership um, through this year 
And then finally, um, with the uh, depending on where the numbers fall, somewhere between 2,500 and 3,000 students who will be graduating um, now having earned in either a GED, a certificate, or an associate degree to our students. Thanks to our faculty and staff for their tremendous work. Congratulations, JCCC class of 2021. That concludes my report. Well said. May I ask on the June 14th event, is that, it said attend, so is that planned to be in person? That it will be a virtual event. Okay. Um, yes, it will be a virtual event. Okay. Questions for Dr. Brown? I had the same question, thank you. Okay. Trustee I, Ingram? I just have a comment. I really appreciate your thanks to the staff and faculty. And I know this is kind of putting us all on the spot, but I, I want to share my thanks to faculty and staff too. And I'm sure each one of you would want to join Dr. Brown in doing the same thing. I, you know, that has been, I, I still say it out loud when I see someone here on campus and I'll say, I just don't know how we can ever thank you enough for all you've had to do. So I'm just gonna jump right out and say it. And I know I don't wanna take the wind out of anyone else's sails because I know you all agree with me, but I just don't know how we will ever thank everyone for all that they have done. So. Um, please join me in saying thank you. <laughs> Simple as that. Well said. Yep. Yeah. Well said. Okay. I think we're ready all the way for new business at almost 730. Um, there's no item on the agenda, but I was going to remind everybody, you, you received yesterday, I think, from Dr. Bound. Nope, not everybody did. Just you and Jerry and Laura who had worked on the... Oh, excuse me. Jumped the gun on you guys. You're going to receive from Dr. Bound the presidential evaluation form and process that was developed earlier by Trustee Cook and Trustee Smith Everett, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you will receive that. He is going to get his self-evaluation to us by June 1. <laughs> We're gonna ask everybody to re get their own evaluation back into Terry by June 8th. That gives you a week, including a weekend so that we can then discuss it at our meeting on June 17th mm -hmm. um, and do his evaluation on the 17th. So the reason to bring it up is to let you know it's coming and let you know we're not going to give you a lot of time to fill out the evaluation form for Dr. Bound after you see his. You will have your form ready to go and you can start on it, but uh, you will get his self-evaluation first. So any questions on that? Are you striving for some goal of most executive sessions in a I, chairmanship? I think I've already achieved that. <laughs> um, Second. Is that, is that double our salary or something? Uh, <laughs> no, that's all I have for new business. I have no old business. I forgot to recognize Mike Neal. Um, oh, and, absolutely. And we have a new team member with us on the uh, leadership team of the college. And I just wanted to recognize Mike Neal, who certainly we did in the committee as a whole, but for the listening audience as well. Uh, Mike joins us um, from Southwest Tennessee Community College, where he served as Vice President of Finance and Administration. And uh, he has certainly hit the ground running. And so what I will say to you as trustees, um, if you would like to have some, some time with him to get to know him, um, I know he would welcome that, and, and what I'd ask is that you work with Terry to let her know. I'm also going to offer that up for uh, Leslie Harden as well, our VP um, for HR, um, that if you'd like to spend some time with them, we'd, we'd love for you to do that. Um, and Mike, I don't know if you want to make any comments. Just real brief. Uh, I've been here for about two weeks. I've enjoyed it thus far. It's going very, very well. It's been a lot of time uh, listening and talking to folks across the college, spent a lot of time with Randy and, uh, and, and Mickey as well. And I uh, had the chance to meet two trustees this week, uh, Trustee Smith Everett uh, today. And yesterday I had the good fortune of meeting uh, Trustee Ingram and she paid me a great compliment. She says he thought I was a student. So uh, that made my day. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you, Mike. I, I, think it, I think at some point going forward, it might be worth it for us to allow your VPs and executive VPs, uh, each of them maybe just per meeting to introduce themselves and let people know who the leadership Absolutely. is on this on this campus because I think we have an outstanding group and we do have two new people in Leslie and Mike. Uh, and we have some outstanding folks that have that are still carrying over. So, okay. Anything else before the consent no, agenda? 
The consent agenda is a series of items that have been reviewed by staff uh, that are routine items. They're usually handled in one, one motion and one vote. Any trustee has the right to take any item off the consent agenda and have it considered separately. Um, is there any item on the consent agenda tonight? Um, item Roman numeral 11 on your agenda. Any consent agenda item anybody wants to have considered separately? If not, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Second. Moved by Trustee Smith Everett and seconded by Trustee Cross. Discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Yes. Opposed no. <clears throat> that motion carries unanimously. Um, we do um, have an executive session tonight. <laughs> Uh, this board uh, has been stellar in the number of executive sessions in the last three months. The amount of time we've all spent, um, it is appreciated. It's been important. And as Dr. Leiker <coughs> indicated, it's, uh, we think, led to an agreement in uh, negotiations with the faculty union that will allow us to have stability for the next three years. So I would like to entertain a motion to go into executive session for the purpose of discussing employer-employee negotiations. No action will be taken during the session. The executive session will last for one hour, beginning at 7.35 p.m. and ending at 8.35 p.m., at which time open session will resume at this same location for those in person and by the Zoom video conference for the rest. We'd like to invite Dr. Andy Bown, Dr. Mickey McLeod, Mike Neal, Dr. Randy Weber, Dr. Leslie Harden, Dr. Leroy Cox, Dr. Gurbishan Singh, Rachel Lears, Colleen Chandler, Kelsey Nazar, and Melody Rail to join this executive session. May I have such a motion, however, reluctantly? Who's Kelsey Nazar? So, so moved. So moved. Second. Moved by Trustee Snyder and seconded by Trustee Ingram. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those aye. no. We'll see you in the Lytle Conference Room. Uh, in a couple minutes and trustee Lawson you will join us at the other link right correct I just got the link thank you yeah. mr. chair thank you all we'll be resume here at 835 okay. welcome back to the Johnson County Community College Board of Trustees meeting it is 835 we have returned from executive session no action was taken during the executive session uh, the only thing left on our agenda is adjournment so I would accept a motion to adjourn so moved second Moved by Trustee Ingram, seconded by Trustee Smith Everett. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed no. Thank you all. We are adjourned.